This is the Power Lifting America podcast, and today we've got an interview with the 69 kilo Open National Champion Chelsea Savitt, who is now a back-to-back member of the U.S. National Team. Chelsea was two weeks out from the IPF World Champions of Malta when we recorded this, and her prep has been going better than ever. Chelsea has been competing for over 10 years now, but her career almost came to an end after her first appearance at the World Championships in 2017, culminating in an extremely serious back surgery. It's taken her five years, but now she's hitting all-time PRs on all three lifts and looking to shock the world in Malta. Before we start, remember to stay tuned to our YouTube and Instagram for our coverage of the most stacked IPF World Championships in history. History. We'll have a media team on the ground in Malta bringing you behind the scenes, athlete interviews, press conferences, pre and post game shows, and more. Follow us on Instagram at powerlifting underscore America. Thank you to SBD and Aleco for their continued partnership with powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tests of powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting America.com and become a member. Now, let's get to this interview with the national champion, Chelsea Savitt. All right, what's up? I've got the bench god, but total specialist. 69 kilo national champion Chelsea Savitt. What's up, Chelsea? Wow, what a what a promo. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, I remember the post. You said you're a total specialist now, but you're still a bench god. So we got to get them both in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want to say that it's offensive when people call me a bench specialist uh-huh. because I feel like it it discounts my total. Like I have yeah. a big total. Um yeah. But I also have a big bench, so I'm not going to be upset when someone talks about my big bench. But let's also talk about my big total. Yeah, I got, absolutely. I got a big squat. And I got a big deadlift, too. Like <laughs> Exactly. You definitely so, do. appreciate definitely the promo. Do. Of course, of course. Uh, you know, I try to keep all this stuff straight in my head. You know, we've got so many lifters in Poverty in America, but especially a classic open team. You know, we got a special place in our hearts for for y'all. And so I remember when you made that, that you're the total, you're a total specialist. Don't call me a bench specialist anymore, but bench gold medalist, bench press national champion. Um, so you're definitely good at bench press as well. Thank but, you. Thank you. But um, how are things going? How, how are you feeling? Well, like two weeks out. I leave for Malta in about a week and a half and I knew it would come up quickly, but it, it came up really quickly. Um, yeah. And honestly, I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, not only the experience of getting to compete in another world championship, um, but I'm looking forward to a vacation too. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it's getting really close. So I'm really excited. I'm feeling good today. Yeah, it's a, it's an awesome location. I think we're all pumped to get there and just like soak in the, the sights as well as obviously the competition itself. Are you sticking around and doing travel before or after or? Are you doing the uh, cruise on the, that Wednesday or anything like that? Uh, so I get, I arrive about a week before my meet and that had to do with just like pricing of flight of flights as well as um, kind of wanting to get to the area a little bit early so that I could acclimate um, yeah. before um, my meet. So, and my meet is on the 15th and that cruise is the day before and I do not oh. want to get a sunburn. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Um, I'm gonna need the day off myself, so I don't think yeah. I'm gonna do it either. But who knows? So let's say if someone wants to twist my leg into into going. If you were the day after, yeah. then I'd be up for it. But day before my meet, it's a little bit risky. I might get a sunburn, and uh, sunburn is not gonna be good for my lifts. That's right. You're lifting on the same day as Delaney, and I talked to him about this too. He's just like just being out in the sun all day the day before you lift is just not not gonna be smart. So yeah, it's you'll tiring. Both be hiding hiding out in the hotel, chilling. Yeah, actually, I distinctly remember. So I used to be a gymnast, like first, you know, 20 years of my life. And uh, I don't know, the parents all wanted us to do this Cancun meet (laughs) when Uh I was like 14 years old. And uh, I'll never forget some of the some of the teenage gymnasts just got roasted in the sun, like absolute lobsters, and uh, just had disastrous performances. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it's draining. (laughs) Yeah, uh, but also sunburn is very physically painful. Yeah. Um, like you basically injure yourself. So mm-hmm. no sunburn injuries for me. I've been working meat. on my tan. That's for after my meets. So I'm not going to get <laughs> yeah, sunburned. Yeah. You're getting a little base tan, a pre-tan. <laughs> yes, exactly. Nice. Mowing the lawn with my shirt off, things like that. The neighbors love me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that prepared. So yeah. no cruise for me. But after is fair game. Yeah, so the, what are you going to, do you guys have plans for afterwards and stuff? You going to travel um, around? What are you up to? What are you, you going to do? Honestly, keeping it open. Uh, cool. Going to hang around in Malta, at least through the banquet. 
Um, I'm flying out of Malta, but uh, I have about a week and a half to play with after my meet. Nice. And I think it's going to be either staying in Malta the whole time or maybe checking out Sicily and coming back. Cool. cool. I don't know. But I don't have, I have about five days where I don't have anything booked. I don't have a hotel booked or Airbnb. Um, so Flying I'm just going to see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it'll be all right. <laughs> Maybe, um, maybe I'll be camping on the street. We'll see. Yeah. Um, my wife is actually flying out on the, um, the day after the competition ends and we're staying, just staying put in Malta for like five days. Nice. And, um, we just booked Airbnbs like yesterday or the day before, and there's still a ton of good ones available. Yeah. It, it seemed like there were a good amount available and yeah. prices are not too bad. No. Also, I should say one thing I'm really looking forward to, since you mentioned your wife is like, I have a lot of people coming out to watch me in Malta. Oh, really? Like my family. Yeah. Um, my my two partners are coming. That's uh, awesome. My brothers, my parents, my first Everyone cousin. Everyone wants to go to Malta. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, this is my third world championship. Like, you guys didn't <laughs> show up to the other two. What's, what's different about fair this Fairweather fans. Wow. Yeah. Fairweather fans. But I'm not going to complain about it. But uh, yeah, I have two aunts coming. Two cousins. Uh, wow. an uncle and my two partners and my parents and my two brothers. That's like so exciting. I, I tried yeah. to get more family to come, but it was too much of a late, late call for, for my travel plans. But I could yeah. just envision having like a, a sick Airbnb right on the beach, like a huge house or something and just have everyone coming and going and just doing their own things and stuff and how fun it would be. So, yeah. So I'm looking fun. forward to all of it. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Me too. So I think everyone, everyone in powerlifting is, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. So, so um, is, is everything going good in training? Heading into it? How are you feeling? Honestly, I, this is a really good prep for me. Funny enough, someone asked me, uh, who I hadn't seen in a while in the gym, he asked me how training was going. And I thought about it for a second. I said, training is like the one thing that's keeping me grounded right now. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like the rest of my life has been a bit chaotic being completely honest. So having this goal and meet to train for, and just, you know, I have to go to the gym. I can't miss, um, yeah. or else, I mean, I can miss, but like, you know, I have to, it's just like, you, you got to shower, yeah. you got to brush your teeth. Like the training has really, um, it's really kept me grounded. Mm -hmm. So I've enjoyed the process so far. Um, I've managed to clear up some like nagging issues that I had leading into nationals. Um, I feel like Kristen and I have sort of optimized some aspects of my training as well, because, you know, every, every prep you is a learning experience and, um, you take what you learned from previous prep and you make some adjustments in the, in the next prep. So I feel like my prep keeps getting better and better. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I've just had some good momentum ever since nationals. Uh, I think that really since I started my wave two of powerlifting in January, 2022, um, not to say that I was on shaky ground, but a lot of my, a lot of 22, 2022 for me was, I felt like experimental and just like mm -hmm. exploring curiosity, um, seeing where this will go. But I feel like even since like having a challenger at nationals in, in 20, in February and coming out on top, I feel like I've just kind of stepped into a mental zone of confidence and um, feeling a lot more just sure of myself in my training, in my overall effort and in my uh, capabilities as a competitor. So again, I just feel like training has been really keeping me grounded and it's something that makes me feel good about myself and yeah. uh so yeah. i've enjoyed the whole process and frankly it's going really well so i'm really looking it. forward to um bringing a strong package to my weight class and my competition in what is it two and a half weeks or week yeah and a half? basically two and, two and, and a half weeks, weeks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so it's like uh from thursday two weeks from this upcoming thursday um yeah that's exciting i mean you think you because when did you start working with Kristen? January 1st, 2022. Okay. So it's basically you've, you've just locked in 
just over a year of, of, you know, having consistent coaching from one person, um, and, and really being focused and zoned in and, and then going through a bunch of different blocks and figuring out what works and what doesn't. And now you're just kind of like on, you know, cruising, it seems like. Uh, yes. In my quote unquote wave two of powerlifting, yeah. because yeah. I competed in worlds in 2017. So, yeah. you know, I was, I had everything dialed in, in the, my first five years of powerlifting. Um, yeah. But better now, I would say. Who was your coach then? Was Andre. Also- okay, Andre. All right. So you still have consistency in your, uh, co- in your team around you because Andre's still there, obviously. Yeah, and, and he's really you- helpful. Yeah, really helpful day to day in the gym. Yeah, and then now, and then you have Kristen kind of calling the programming or you know and and whatnot. So that's really yep. awesome. Um, yeah, I also it's- recently um, added Kedrick. I don't know. What is his last name? Quan. Kedrick Quan. Kedrick Quan. <laughs> yeah. I recently added him to um, my coaching squad as uh, my nutrition coach um, just about four weeks ago. Um, yes. I'm not, re- yeah, I'm not really concerned. And I said this to him. I said, I'm not really concerned about my ability to make weight for nationals. Um, I know I'll be fine, but I tend to get a bit heavy in the off season. So mm. I kind of think that it would be a good idea to have a nutrition coach actually for my off season, but Mm -hmm. we may as well start now because maybe you'll help me optimize some things, uh, leading into leading into worlds. Yeah. Because do you do nutrition coaching too, for other people? I do. Um, I, I don't advertise a lot of my coaching, but I'm pretty, pretty much referral based. Um, and yeah, I do help people with nutrition. Um, I consider myself to be relatively competent in the subject and yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get into the backstory as to why, but, <laughs> um, I worked, I worked with a pro bodybuilder, um, on the back end for a okay. few years. And, um, so I would say through that process, I amassed a good amount of just experience. And, uh, I do have a few clients in nutrition who, frankly, it's a fulfilling experience for me. I think it's a mutually fulfilling experience and, uh, yeah, so I consider myself to be relatively knowledgeable in the subject, but I also consider myself to be knowledgeable in training as well. Um, yeah. But you know, we're we're humans and we need a coach. Yeah, <laughs> coaches need coaches. So um, because we have our own, we have our. I don't know if I can cuss on the project <laughs> on the podcast. Oh yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> you can cuss on. Can we have <laughs> we all have our own shit. shit so yeah, <laughs> we have exactly. our own shit to deal with. Uh, so um, it's definitely given me a little bit more peace of mind and. Uh, Andre tends to fill the gap of like a coach that I don't have. So Mm -hmm. something I've observed over just like 10 years of our relationship is when he's my, when he used to be my coach, you know, he had both hats, like husband and coach. Yeah. Um, And sometimes, I don't know, it's just like, you just want him to be the husband. Like, yeah. (laughs) So um, I definitely off I would say prior to hiring Kedrick I would offload a lot of just like my stress and just frustration and emotions around nutrition to him so I find that I'm doing that less now so I think that's, that's cool I think that's better for our relationship <laughs> definitely <laughs> <laughs> and, just um, offload he, that stress somewhere else and Andre is coming out to Malta right so he'll be in the warm-up room with you yep he okay. submitted his handler form late Okay. Yeah. There were a lot of forms we've had to fill out, oh, so I goodness. hope it's okay. <laughs> this one, this there's been more forms than ever, um, according to Bonica and Heather, who who've been there around the block a handful of times. Yeah, um, it's been interesting. Uh, their website's nice, though. I mean, it's at least there's the all website's this stuff nice in, for sure. Yeah, at least it's all there in one spot. It's just, yeah, it's just like you got to refresh it every thirty minutes. See what else <laughs> they had it on there. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I feel like I'm dropping the ball if I'm not checking in on the Malta IPF website like every day. <laughs> yeah. But so. yeah, that's cool. Okay. And so, yeah, I mean, I've been following along on Instagram, um, people who follow Power of the America, you know, we repost all your training on the stories and stuff. And we see, you know, you're hitting rep PRs and you're hitting PRs here and there and stuff. And it just looks like, like you said, um, to me, I, I mean, uh, I got to meet you, you know, more in depth in Reno at bench press nationals. And at that time, I kind of felt like you got something going on. Like you like, like you building momentum, like, like you're starting to really catch fire. You're kind of coming into your stride in terms of 
this new wave of training that you're in now. And it carried right over into uh, Open Nationals in Austin. And I think it's going to carry right over into Malta, into IPF Worlds and going to shock the, the world. That's going to shock the world, huh? All right. So we'll yeah. get back into some stuff on the details of that. Unless there's anything you want to say, go ahead. I definitely feel stronger than before Nationals. I'll say that. Yeah. It My... looks like it because you haven't missed any training. Yeah, I haven't missed training. Uh, yeah. I did have two weeks that were tough because I had to travel to Chicago for work and yeah. work travel is not just like going to Chicago and hanging out. It's like yeah. being in the office all day um, and then getting pinged late at night, at least in my career. Yeah. Um, so that was a tough two weeks, but I got through it. I managed to show up to the gym again, as I said, training has really been keeping me grounded. I even think that during that two week Chicago trip, um, training kept me grounded. I had to show up to the gym. I wasn't going to skip. Definitely. And it it gives like, you something to focus too. Like even just finding the gyms. I remember you were posting a lot about that and then correct me if I'm wrong, but you came home from that trip and then immediately PR'd something. Yeah. I think you PR'd a squad or, or a PR my bench or hit like a rep yeah. PR. Yeah. And you were yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. you it's like okay. just came home and you, and you, you know, PR something. So I was like, hey, I guess that trip did you okay then, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was okay. It was, I, I, I worked through it and uh, yeah. 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 Cause you know, you expect travel is really going to, you know, eat away and um, you know, wear you out a little bit, especially like with the intense work stuff. It, it definitely does. Um, I was in a perpetually fatigued state, but I made the most of it. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Still got to yeah. have my jobs so that I could pay for the Malta trip. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and all, wherever you might go afterwards. Yeah. So um, in in other news, in current events, um, the whole powerlifting world has been kind of talking about Sheffield and um, this huge competition that happened. And what's your take on it? What, did you watch it? And are, you know, yeah. What 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 do you think about Sheffield? So I watched Sheffield. I, uh, it was like a midday Saturday, like, Got it set nice. up on my big TV, watched it on my couch. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. It was it was a really awesome event. I would have loved to see it live. Um, I know. It looked like the production was incredible. But you could even feel that from, I was able to feel that from my living, the comforts of my living room. So, um, yeah, and every competitor there was just really impressive. Even the ones who didn't have good meets, like, for them, were still really impressive competitors and uh i don't know it's just cool to see like uh, it's like a it was like a prime time session but like more than a prime time session yeah. uh it was it, yeah it was fun to watch and uh looked like an awesome meet and uh i thought it was really good for powerlifting too um not that we don't have big meets but you know one thing i kind of think would be nice about ipf worlds is like if they, I don't want to say that it shouldn't be a country thing, but it, there's definitely competitors in each country who, you know, if more than one person got to go on the team, like multiple mm -hmm. would be in, you know, in podium, uh, in contention for the podium. Um, so I think it's interesting to have a meet where, you know, it's kind of like, even though everyone was wearing their country singlets, it's kind of like just putting country aside and just bringing the best athletes uh, and giving them the spotlight. So yeah. I think it would be cool to have more meets like that where it's just, no, you don't have to get that one spot on your team, but like, yeah, there could be two, even, even three people like who get a chance to compete and it just makes it that much more awesome of a meet. Definitely. No, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, that, that was a really cool thing about seeing it was kind of just like, you know, it was country based, but then there's also like personal teams as well. Like, you know, that are coaching people from different countries, personal coaches and stuff. But then, like you said, it's just really just the best of the best. And it just doesn't matter, you know, not just one from each country or anything like that. It's, it's basically just the best of the best and it doesn't matter what countries you're from. Yeah. Um, they're all going to show up and be there. What do you think about as far as like inspiring the next generation or also maybe even inspiring the next generation of like meet directors, like where the sport could go and um, you know, what the p possibilities are. Like, I feel like it's kind of unlocked a new level in powerlifting in terms of kind of like reawakening sort of the imagination of, 
the whole powerlifting community of what wow like the ceiling is way higher than we thought it was before I feel like it's hard for me to say because I wasn't there yeah, <laughs> I saw yeah. pictures of the experience I didn't you know I didn't compete yeah. um and I saw the live stream but like you know, I saw that it was a, a huge production in like this gorgeous like theater. Um, yeah. You know, it was really well commentated. The live stream was great. It looked like there were some just awesome like media backdrops. Was there? Yeah. I think there was like steam on the platform. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I don't think there was fire, Hopefully. but I think there was steam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then they had like this. Everyone looked dapper AF at the banquet. In, in this like really just like elegant looking um banquet hall yeah um it just looked like it looked fancy it looked bougie yeah it's <laughs> and, your kind uh, of thing huh Chelsea I mean <laughs> hey what are you trying to say here <laughs> I mean it looked fun um yeah so and I I think that at least like in the U.S., it definitely could be something that inspires lifters to move over possibly from the USAPL to Powerlifting America. So mm -hmm. it probably serves to at least just, you know, get people more interested in this federation. Um, but from a just inspiring meet, direct, meet directors, like, I mean, I've been in powerlifting a pretty long time now and yeah. I've done local meets, I've done, I've done worlds and I've done national meets. And I, I think that the bar just keeps getting elevated um for powerlifting as the sport grows as we um yeah i mean as the sport grows especially um there's more people in it and there's more people who want to be successful in it so i think it's just a rising tide lifts all shifts sort yeah. of thing mm -hmm. where the bar just keeps getting there's more people coming into the sport and the bar just keeps getting elevated so I think that's happening all around in terms of meets that are available. Um, I think you've said this before, where like the NAP, you expect the NAPF meet to become like a big meet. Yeah. Um, like I could see that happening too, where, you know, there starts to be more attention to like the regional um, IPF meets because IPF worlds is extremely tough to get into, especially in certain countries where yeah, like, true. I don't want to say the B team, but like the ones who are in the, who don't quite make the the world spots like they're still incredible lifters yes. um and if they go to napfs like it'll be an awesome meet so again rising tide lifts all ships yeah more people into powerlifting more um people committed to um just kind of disseminating knowledge and information um there's more there's more information available now. Uh, I feel like the standards yeah. are just so much higher than they used to be um, 10 years ago in terms of what you have to do to kind of be at that top level. Um, and yeah, the meets available um, are part of that as well. The standards for meets keep getting elevated as well. So, yeah. uh, I mean, like this year's NAPF, Ray Williams has confirmed. Oh, uh, so I mean, like, there you go. Arguous, uh, arguably the goat of goats is, is yeah. NAPF. So, oh, I love that. Uh, it's That's no so longer, cool. it's no longer, you know, um, going to be neglected as a competition. It's going to become, I, I want it to be like euros. Euros is such a important mm. competition in Europe. I mean, it, like you said, it's, it's, you know, B team, um, but it's, it's people that maybe they can't, can't make it to open worlds, but they're right at that level. Yeah. And it's like you there's only so many spots that you can get on the world's team. So only 16 spots. So that like 17, 18, 19 best lifters, they need some place to go and show out and show their strength and have an international competition. And I think it's just really cool. And APF is that for us. But then also in the IPF now with these um Arnolds around the world. Mm, Arnolds too. There was just one in Brazil. Um, there was just, you know, obviously the UK Arnold is like a super high production, great quality meet as well. So there is like this international competition that's available out there through the IPF. So it's really cool. And and all those meets are getting leveled up as far as production quality. And I think, I think Sheffield has raised the bar for sure. I think it's kind of created a little bit of a new standard. Certainly it's a, uh, it's a standard to shoot for that is yeah. going to be difficult to attain though, you know, for, for still years to come, I think. For and sure. they, yeah. they just announced um, earlier that it's going to be back in, in 2024 it, they announced the date February 10th everyone put it on their calendar and I think they increased the prize pool by like 100 grand US um, yeah I'm I mean, not sure what it is in pounds but uh, I saw some of the marketing for it it just looks really good so yeah. 
again, yeah. it's not just like the production of the meat itself, but it's also like the hype that they're exactly. creating too. Exactly. The promotion for it's everything, it and everything the, like that. the full production of it, yeah. the social media, the yeah. Yeah. I want to see, you know, people take a page out of Sheffield playbook, like with IPF worlds, with, you know, pop the American nationals, other countries with their national championships and just kind of, you know, elevate all of that. So yeah. um, like you said, even just the hype of it is, is a good, you know, if we can just take that one little idea and throw it into nationals or to IPF worlds, you know, that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, rarely do you see a meet already being talked out, like talked about about a year before the meet. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Already everyone's looking forward to the next Sheffield. And I, I mean, even two weeks before Worlds, we're yeah. talking about Sheffield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're tied, you know, because you, that's how you qualify to get into Sheffield. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. So, all right, let's um, get into some some of your your story your lifting story um let's go back to last year's worlds in 2022 and what was special about going back to worlds again in 2022 because you have been in 20 what was it 2017 that was in uh, minsk belarus yeah in the you 72 were, kilo class when that existed yeah so you were 72 and back in 2017 and here we are like five years later back onto the world stage again. So like, why was this one special to get back? Uh, <laughs> for many reasons. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> break, give us the backstory. No pun intended. <laughs> nah. um, yeah. So I, my first powerlifting meet was in 2013. Um, and I competed primarily in the 72 kilo class uh, those first five years. Mm -hmm. And I got, and I managed to compete in worlds in 2017 and i actually got off the alternate spot um because kim walford was also in the 72 class in the u.s so and kim walford is basically the goat of goats i know yes, you, exactly. you use that for ray williams but you might say yeah. for women that kim walford is the goat of all goats yes. um so she was a she was a tough challenger i was only going to get a spot as an alternate so <laughs> i forget who dropped out um in 2017 but yeah so i got to compete in 2017 and uh i just missed the podium by half a kilo oh my goodness yeah wow, i dropped my third deadlift after i fully locked it out um so that was devastating but it was still a great experience uh, i think my total was 500 and third place was 500.5 by isabella von weissenberg yep. uh so after that i was like oh man i missed the podium by half a kilo i gotta get yeah. back and then four uh, months later, you did you did five hundred two point five, maybe just to prove a point, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, that ended up being a really rough training cycle, um, where uh, I was in a lot of physical pain. Um, I kind of knew I had a back issue, but just sort of ignored it, so to speak, just to because I had tunnel vision. Um, and then after I competed at nationals in 2017, USAPL raw nationals, uh, mm. I just kind of let all the pain, let myself process all the pain and it was really bad. And, uh, like, but what was it? Bothered. What was the injury? So it was actually, it was not an acute injury. It was a long-term, um, injury called spondylolisthesis. Um, so basically in my spine, and I apologize if I'm bad at explaining this. I'm not a physical therapist. <laughs> um, right. But basically, your spine has vertebrae stacked on each other, right? And then there's, there's these little bones. They're called the pars bones that hold those vertebrae together, essentially. And um, in spondylolisthesis, those pars bones fracture. And then over time, the vertebrae just starts to, to drift. Mm. Um, and it, it might drift forward, so you're you kind of have more of an arch to your back. It might drift to the side so that you kind of get like a, a squiggle or um, it might drift kind of back in which case you start to round your back. Um, and mine shifted in such a way where I had lordosis, hyperlordosis, or I was uh, more of an arch essentially. Um, but with that comes compression of the nerve root, um, which is, where the pain really is, uh, mm -hmm. is in the compression of that nerve root. So um, I had some direct back pain and I also had some radiating uh, nerve pain down my leg. 
and um, both of which affected me in my day-to-day activities, just like going to the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Um, but spondylolisthesis is not necessarily something that you have to immediately get surgery for or even ever get surgery for. It really just depends on the progression of it. Um, but mine was originally from my years as a gymnast. I was going to say, I know gymnasts, you know, they have a lot, uh, can often have a lot of like compression uh, type issues with their back. Yeah. So I was a, I was a gymnast from like the age of five. I forget what year I quit, but I think I was 20. Um, I did it through my freshman year of college. Um, And then I had to quit, just couldn't do it anymore um, for many reasons. But um, I did have the spondy from the gymnastics, Mm -hmm. but orthopedists basically said, you don't need surgery for this now, but you probably will down the road. Um, So it was always in the back of my mind. Um, But then I started powerlifting (laughs) and it was fine for a while Um, up until I guess year 2017, um, things started to get bad. And, uh, you know, so after nationals, I was in a lot of pain. in 2017 and consulted multiple uh, just clinicians and physical therapists who I who were familiar with the sport. They were not people who were going to tell me to not lift weights. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, the consensus was, yeah, I mean, you have to get surgery. Like, Oh, wow. So I got the surgery in January, 2018, and they put five screws in my spine, oh. entered both the front and the back. Uh, so they flipped me over during the surgery, um, inserted a tita- titanium cage in between the where the disc used to be, um, between my L5 and S1 vertebrae. Oh my God, this sounds and, insane. Uh, yeah, it was a really intense. Yeah, it was. They cut me up. So this is like a real. This is not like just a a minor procedure here. This is really serious. Yeah. <laughs> I could send pictures too. I don't know if you overlay the podcast with pictures, but no, no, we don't. We don't do any okay. production or editing. <laughs> I've got a lot of photos of my social media, so um... no, I've seen, I've seen, and I knew. I mean, I knew it was really serious, but kind of just explaining that process of like all this different, like, wow. I mean, it's it's a miracle. I mean, obviously, they're doing that to to fix your back and make it so that you could do things like live life without pain, just day to day. Yeah. But I mean, to think like, did anyone expect you to become a national champion, like world class power lifter after this? So it was like a big unknown. Like you, there's not a huge sample size of elite power lifters who get spinal fusions and then come back. No. <laughs> it's literally a sample size of zero. Um, mm, I'm yeah. sample size of one, if you will. Um, so it was a big unknown. I, I did expect that I'd be able to, um, like engage in physical activity. I did expect, I I was under the impression that I'd be able to lift again. Um, but I thought that it would be very different, not much spine loading, um, more like just go to the gym, isolation movements type of thing, working out. Yeah. Yeah, Not training. Um, Right. So I frankly thought that I was done with competitive powerlifting, one hundred percent. Um, and I mentally that was like a lot to process, but also I was like, you know, that's just your, that's I mean, be happy, like you got to compete at worlds. You were upset with taking fourth, but hey, fourth is awesome. You got a silver mm-hmm. in bench. You got to go to worlds. Um, yeah. I. You know, I had a pretty successful career up until that point. So, like, yeah. you know, I, I felt like it was cut short in terms of me still having goals that I wanted to achieve and feeling like I was not at my, like, I didn't reach my full potential. But I also kind of accepted, like, what else could I do? Like, I had to mm-hmm. accept it um, or else I was just going to be really upset every day for the well, rest of my life. So, um I- you learn to live with your new circumstances. And I definitely did. It was a struggle, but, um, I got there to a point of acceptance. So, yeah. Was that similar? Like whenever you got out of gymnastics, um, you know, you had done something for 15 years, you said, you know, from, from age five to, to age 20 and 
you know, having to put that behind you and move on from gymnastics, similar kind of like mental state of like, how did you deal with that? And did that help kind of prepare you for this, you know, kind of be like, well, I've done this before. I've, where I've had a thing that was a really important part of my life. And I moved on from, maybe I'll move on from this and take up, maybe I'll find the next thing. It's funny you bring that up because it was a similar experience of this was like, I don't want to say that it was my whole life because I mean, I was in the marching band. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh shoot. I, I was, <laughs> I was in the marching band. I, uh, you know, it wasn't my sole identity, but when I was a gymnast, but it was a big part of my identity. Yeah. Um, so having to give it up was definitely tough, but I also was not really, I mean, I was like 20 and frankly, not very well emotionally regulated, <laughs> didn't have good coping skills or yeah. I, didn't, I should have been in therapy for many years, but <laughs> I had never gone to therapy. So, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was different because I was in a different stage of my life. Um, okay. But I mean, I did had been through that before where like, okay, I need to um, reframe my sense of self. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I would say in a way I had been through it before uh, with gymnastics, but um, I, I think with powerlifting, it was a bit more tough because I, I had gone a lot further with it than... Okay. Um, I thought that I would. And um, also I felt like I was, I hadn't achieved all of my goals. Yeah. Frankly, with gymnastics, I never, like, I just wanted to compete in collegiate gymnastics. I yeah. never really wanted to like go beyond that. Um, I mean, I wanted to be good, but I wasn't, for me, it was kind of like a means to an end, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like, I didn't desire to compete at the Olympics at the international elite level. I was satisfied with getting to compete um, at the collegiate level. Um, so I feel like gymnastics, I kind of achieved what I set out to achieve. And maybe that's part of the reason why it wasn't, I mean, it was hard, but it also, again, just a different experience. Whereas with powerlifting, yeah. I felt like, man, I got to get back to worlds and um, get on that podium. So and here I am in 2023. <laughs> yeah i mean Later. well he, here we are in 2022 um, yeah i know thinking, we're still talking about 2022 yeah i mean oh. so with all of that i mean i i don't think i mean i certainly didn't know walking into pa nats round one in austin um the first one you know whatever year that 2022 i guess it was um i didn't know all this backstory the whole hype around it was you're going against your coach chris and Dunstan, yeah you know i was like that's the least interesting thing about that is so about interesting. This. Yeah, because I'm now I'm thinking back on it, and even even I was guilty of kind of being like, "That's Fine. that's the thing." It's like, "Oh my god, this is a cool story," but really, it was like, "You this was your comeback story," um, and like this yeah. was you getting back onto this national platform, and then you get on a, a spot onto world's team as an alternate, and it's like, and and go and so I mean, just how how did that feel? Just kind of being like, "Oh, I'm back." I didn't. <laughs> so I, uh, I would say I had imposter syndrome. Um, I was pretty self-deprecating and, uh, I didn't, at least before worlds, like I, you know, I got on the, not to say that getting on the team as an alternate, isn't like respectable. It's very respectable, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it yeah. is very respectable. It's still a big accomplishment. Um, but I was actually thinking of not like, like going into nationals. I was like, I'm not going to go. Like, I'm not, <laughs> not going to go to worlds. It's all the way in South Africa. Yeah, um, I remember you were kind of talking about that. Yeah. And actually, you know, one thing that happened after my back surgery is I kind of gained a lot of weight, like 30, 40 pounds. And I had, you know, just so much happened in, in that span between like back surgery and coming back to the platform. That was just like, me becoming a different person in terms of overall fitness and approach to just training. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, coming to terms with training as a life, the, a, a fitness lifestyle, as opposed to just getting ready for meets. Um, so there was a really big process there. Um, and uh, I kind of wanted to like continue my cut. <laughs> like, uh -huh. I don't know. I felt like I wasn't done with my, um, 
because I kind of figured out the whole nutrition thing, right, in that whole process. So I kind of was like, oh, well, I want to keep my cut going. Um, you know, I want to keep getting stronger. Uh, you know, I don't know how my back's going to hold up. I don't know how my body's going to hold up to any of this, to like yeah. a real peak. Because um, training, a prep is rough on the body. Um, yeah. So I I felt like I was just not super sure of myself, if you will. Um, but then as soon as I got my uh, invitation, I remember I was in the ice cream shop with Andre and uh, the deadline was approaching to accept and I hadn't accepted yet. And I couldn't bring myself to say no. I yeah. was like, and then I, I texted Kristen and she was like, well, of course I want you to go. And then I was like, oh, really? She's like, yeah, it's Worlds. How often do you get to go compete at Worlds? And I'm like, well, I don't know if I feel like I deserve it or that I've trained enough yeah. or that I'll do well there. And then she's like, just accept it and go. Like, figure out the the, the travel expenses. And But, like, you know how you know how big of a deal this is. And, like, yeah. clearly I did, like, internally because I could not bring myself to decline. Um, I was, yeah, it was big anxiety and turns out and then I was and then I accepted and uh had a great meet so yeah yeah so that's so so crazy for me to think that like you went from being like okay you're you're, you're super competitive person obviously you have a, a sports background and you want to win I mean it means to an end you said with gymnastics but then you get this powerlifting bug and like you're doing that at a super high level you get on the worlds you get that fire of like you had you just missed the podium by half a kilo. I mean, you that had to be like this sort of like heartbreak. And then you're in all this. Pain. <laughs> yeah, the heartbreaker third deadlift where I, yeah. Yeah, and then you're in all this pain. And then, you know, you then you still go and do nationals and it's just prep after prep is wearing on you. Your back is getting worse. And suddenly it's all like seemingly over. You're going to have a back surgery that's like, I mean, a very extremely serious back surgery. But then to come all the way back from that and then get the spot and be like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I, that just seems so. I know so it seems weird, but I think mentally yeah. I wasn't in that competitive place. Yeah. Frankly, the meet was in Austin, which is where yeah. I live. Feels and it weird, was around man. the time when I wanted to compete. So Kristen was like, no, why don't you do this meet? Yeah, you'll be competing against me. And I'm probably, you know, not doing myself a favor here by inviting you to the meet because you're strong. But yeah, I mean, you want to compete in like four or five months time. You want to do a local meet. Yeah. Have at it. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> I guess I'll do nationals. Yeah. Um, and at the time, you know, Powerlifting America was a new federation. So I didn't uh, need to like do a qualifying meet. Yeah. So logistically, it made a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was just an awesome. Maybe that's part of it. It just felt like a local meet. Maybe it was a subconscious kind of strategy to re were you were you super stressed and nervous about like, is my back going to hold up or? Yes, uh, the whole prep. I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. I, yeah. <laughs> take it, take it day by day, week by week. Um, I had done a like a little bit of a tune up meet uh, a few months earlier in like October. Yeah, 2021, USPA. the USP local USPA meet, and mm -hmm. it went pretty well. Uh, I was pretty rusty, um, but I was yeah. also pretty strong. So, yeah. you know, I got myself back up there. It took me a really long time to even get to the point where I could watch a powerlifting meet. It was like I had like a phantom pain type of experience every time I would watch lifters. Couldn't watch wow. lifting for years. Um, wow. So, yeah, to just kind of get a little itch and just curiosity again you know again I was training in the gym because I was like I knew I'd be able to train again I was starting to feel better I was doing all of my all of the stuff that Dr. Stuart McGill told me to do uh-huh developing that core <laughs> yeah yeah doing the big three um mm -hmm. not doing a lot of direct spine loading but very slowly over time starting to load my spine and just being comfortable with a really slow progression um and then I was like, huh, I'm getting pretty strong. Maybe I'll just like do the meet, like hit some RPE eight lifts, see what and, happens. And were you with Kristen yet at that point no. when you did the USPA meet? No. No. I just like winged my prep. <laughs> okay. I mean, I prepped so many times for me. Like I kind of know the, I know how it yeah. goes. I know how to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So yeah, and it went pretty well. I think I squatted 175. I was a little heavier. I was closer to 75 kilos. You squatted, um, uh, it, it, oh, at that meet? Yeah, 175, yeah. Benched, I think, 115, yep. pulled 200. I'm 200 like, oh. on the dot. You got your numbers down. Yeah, I'm like, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that is. That was pretty um, good. It was with a deadlift bar, but I was a little bit heavier, but I was like, huh. 482 bad. total. Yep. And then I was like, hey, you know what? I want to hire a coach to just like not to become ultra competitive again, but just to hold me accountable because my training was pretty inconsistent. I winged everything, uh, which, you know, was fine. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was like, yeah, you know, I want some more structure. Um, so I picked Kristen because I wanted someone who had at least as much experience as me in the sport. Okay. And um, I wanted someone who was familiar with dealing with injuries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted someone who um, was educated in the subject and she used a PhD student in exercise science. I also wanted to hire a woman too. Mm -hmm. And uh, there aren't that many, um, still to date, there's not that many female coaches um, who have been around as long as I've been around. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so my list was really small and I already had a relationship with Kristen, like on a friendly level. So it was a gut feeling sort of thing. It wasn't a, Hey, I'm going to hire you. And then we're going to compete against each other <laughs> a few months sort and, of thing. And then fire you or something like yeah. have a falling out and you're yeah. still with her to this day. Spoiler alert for anyone. Yeah. We fast forward. Yeah. That's, that's really. And so she only, I mean, cause you didn't have much time that, that me was in October and then Power of the American Nationals was in was in April. So you how how long were you working with her before Power of the American Nationals? Like just... as I said, you, you could start at 2022, January 1st, oh, yeah, 2022. January 22. Okay. I yeah. messaged her on December 31st, 2021. So four I was months. Like, well, That's because it. I was like, New Year, I'm gonna this is something I want to do. I love it. And then Have some structure. So and then I mean <clears throat> You kind of had this comeback moment in PA Nats. And I mean, just that must have been the moment then that where you kind of felt like, wow, like I'm at, I'm here. You totaled, you know, uh 493. No, yeah. something around that. Yeah, it looks like uh yeah, 493. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, whoops, I was I was calling out your dots before. Um, I was oh, reading the wrong reading the wrong number, but yeah, yeah, 493. So that was kind of must have felt like the sort of like I'm back moment. Did yeah or... i'd say so um Did i mean you... i had some good lifts and yeah. it was also the lowest weight class i'd ever competed in so i you know there was a certain uncertainty there mm -hmm. um of like i don't know what my strength is going to look like at 69 kilos never been that light before in my adult life so you know there was just like a lot of unknowns and wanted to just see what would happen so what happened was i did pretty damn well yeah um, yeah. yeah and so, uh set the stage for the next year and a half okay that's what i was gonna say so i mean then you go to worlds you're back after whatever that was like five years since your previous worlds in belarus yep. and i mean that had to be just you know being back in the scene and just you know you you had to be feeling like i've i've really accomplished something i mean it sounds like you were you kind of had imposter syndrome. You're discounting yourself, but had to be cool when you walk in the warm up room and you're just like, I'm back. I mean, like I'm here, like who would have ever thought like pinch me like uh, that yeah. of all the stuff I went through after my last worlds, I would be back here. Like what Absolutely. a miracle. I, uh, I was so grateful to be there. Um, very present, really soaking it all in. I think now it's funny. I sometimes refer to myself as Chelsea 2.0 in my posts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Chelsea 2.0. I love that. Uh, Chelsea 2.0. So, um, you know, I, I really see every meet as one that has to be fully experienced. Um, you I may not that. get another meet. So that's amazing. Um, I recognize, in a way, my mortality. I also recognize my shelf life. Um, and frankly, just... It's just another level of appreciation that I have um, getting to do any meet, whether it's a, a local meet or a national meet or a world meet or bench nationals. I mean, 
you you do have kind of have to go into every meet saying oh well if this doesn't go well there will be another meet right so you yeah. do have to have that right yeah, but it's also like but you also might not have another meet you but you also can't put too much pressure on yourself i don't know it's like a weird it's a, balance it's a, oh absolutely it's a fine balance of being in the moment in the zone and appreciating it also wanting to kick ass and putting enough pressure on yourself to perform well but realizing you know you have a full life outside of powerlifting as well so it's like this is not everything to me. There will be more meets for sure. But yes, once in a lifetime, twice in a lifetime opportunity. Now three, thrice in a lifetime opportunity. Hopefully more than three times too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, what about the mindset of like when you go into that first Power Team American National or, or you're going into the 2022 Worlds in South Africa and you're kind of counting yourself out a little bit to a certain extent, like imposter syndrome, like you're saying, do you think that that kind of gives you like a, kind of a... um laid back, like, like you said, to um, really not take it for granted and be in the moment and really appreciate everything that you perform better under those type of circumstances, or you perform better when you you're stressing out and putting a lot more pressure on yourself, like perhaps you were doing before, um, you know, with with USAPL raw nationals, and then your first experience with worlds. Well, I think part of my mentality in my Chelsea 2.0 era <laughs> has been um, basically in my period between 2017 and 2022, if you will, I had to kind of come to terms with um, not having powerlifting in my life and then who yeah. I am without it. So, and that was tough at first, but I would say I figured it out. Um, I figured out how to be happy and um, I figured out my sense of self um, without powerlifting. So, you know, part of my mentality going into meets as far as it, I don't know if I'd say that it's laid back, but mm -hmm. I, I don't put so much pressure on myself because it's okay. If I don't perform well, it really is like, I'll be okay. Yeah. And I know I will be okay because I've been through that. You've been through worse. Yeah. I've been through way worse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I know I'll be okay if, I don't do well. So it definitely relieves a lot of pressure in that way where I genuinely do this for fun. Um, mm -hmm. I consider powerlifting now for me to be a pleasure practice. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I do. It, um, it brings joy. I do it for fun. When it stops being fun, I won't do it anymore. And when I say right. fun, I don't mean like on a day to day like grinding yeah. in the gym is fun, yeah. but it's something that in totality, it's fun for me. Yeah. And um, it, your total has gone up. I mean, quite a bit and at a lower body weight now than ever. So, I mean, I think having fun and having that kind of mentality, it's showing up on the platform and it's yeah. showing up in your performances and your strength. Um, so it's been good for you. Uh, specifically at worlds in 2022, you know, you finished with a 495, which up to that point, I think your best total was like your best total ever before that was 502.5. And that was at a weight class up. So, I mean, you're, you're re really just like, a few kilos, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it was the previous they changed weight the weight classes, 69, 72. Um, but still a few kilos makes a big, it does difference. make a difference in. Yeah. For sure. And then obviously a massive back surgery in between as well. So it's like <laughs> yeah. 495 was a big total to do at Worlds. Um, you did miss two lifts. You miss a squat and you miss a deadlift. So I'm sure you had to be kind of thinking that you had more than 495. You were probably good for 500 or 502. Yeah. And like I think that. some of it is just like being rusty. Uh, yeah. I was still rusty. Like that was my third meet since I had yeah. re entered the sport of powerlifting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was definitely better than, uh, PA Nats. So, um, definitely. two kilos better. Uh, I didn't have a lift where I only made one lift, <laughs> which was the case yeah. at PA Nats. I had some better attempt selection. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I just keep getting better each meet. And as I said, in 2017, when I, you know, had a forced exit from the sport of powerlifting, I felt like I had a lot more potential um mm -hmm. i unrealized potential is what i should say yeah. like i was getting stronger um it's just again i felt like the journey was cut short mm -hmm. um so i had to get back to that point where i was like 
almost as strong as I was. Uh, actually, a lot of things have improved as well. So I think, you know, the putting less pressure on myself, really enjoying the process, I would say feeling less entitled too. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think that in a way, my early uh, years of powerlifting, I kind of benefited from a smaller talent pool. Not to say that Kim Walford wasn't there because she was. <laughs> yeah, but we're but, talking uh, 2013. I mean, you're like a legit OG, like 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, not a lot of people were in the sport th that are in the sport today were around in 2013. Oh, yeah. And it was so. different. Uh, I mean, I won junior nationals, my first nationals with less than an, I don't even know what my total, what was my total? I got open powerlifting. It was less than 900 pounds. Uh-huh. 383. It's uh, like kilos 383 yeah and I was junior national champ so yeah. like I kind of sailed my way to that and then uh I took second in open nationals after that year um multiple times and there were just many ways that I didn't have my shit together uh, mm -hmm. so I mean I would train at like 10 p.m at night like my lifestyle was not good I did a lot of nutrition cycling um I mean, I was in it and I was dedicated, but I was, uh, there were a lot of ways I was just not like, I was an amateur. What did you, what do you mean when you said you felt entitled because you had been in it for so long that you kind of felt like, Hey, I'm the junior national champ. Like, this is all kind of like predestined for me. I'm going to be a, a national champion and a world champion. Um, in a way. Yeah. I guess the, the best. And again, I look at it in, looking at my past self as a sense of entitlement, right? Yeah. Um, entitled in the sense that I didn't have to work that hard in order to gotcha. um, move mountains in the sport. Mm -hmm. um, now I have to work really hard. Oh yeah. Really, really hard. You're everything has to be dialed in. Weight class in the world. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, every weight one, class one, is one really, com yeah. every weight class is really competitive now. And even yeah. if you look at, the the good lift nomination if you look at the nominations nominating totals this year versus last year i mean i think i was nominated maybe fourth fifth or sixth with my 493 now mm -hmm. that's not even in like the prime time session that wouldn't even be in the prime time session uh yeah no it wouldn't um it, the eighth place is 507 <laughs> yeah so yeah it wouldn't that, even it would be in the b time. group that's the prime time um, cutoff. If you want to call it that. But you yeah, this go, year. You, you would have been nominated 12th. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would have been total. 13th. 13th. Yeah. I would have been nominated. Yeah, 13th. Yeah, Not sorry. to say that 13th is bad, but it's just like last year that was sixth nomination. So yes. um, yeah, I, it's not to say that I didn't work hard because I did work hard yeah. earlier, but I didn't have to work as hard as I do now. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, to, it's good though. It seems yeah. like you're ready for it. It seems like you're you have the right men, mindset now to embrace that kind of competition. Um, and yeah. So and then let's. So at Worlds in 2022, you also you got a gold medal. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool, right? That I was mean, cool. That was really like cool. You had mentioned <laughs> before you got a silver and you just barely missed the podium. Um, in this one, you finish in fifth, but you got a gold medal to come away with so that had to be just a great accomplishment like oh great yeah, yeah loved it I, mean, I could say yeah. i got a gold medal at worlds the rest of my life yes that's a freaking awesome so after worlds then like now what are you thinking like okay you you went there you did the thing um you finished fifth and you got the gold medal and on bench and you're coming back how did you reframe your goals then at that point like like were you like okay it's on for me now like this i could be the best in the world wow um that's flattering but uh um obviously i had a really good outcome i took fifth and yeah. uh fifth at worlds is awesome uh so and i went seven for nine um i knew i had more in the tank yep. and i was just really enjoying the process i'm like well May as well just keep training and seeing if you could do this again. And if you don't, like getting stronger is fun. You're really enjoying this process. Again, not I'll be fine if I, I don't get there. I know I'll be fine. But 
mm -hmm. may as well just like ride this wave. All so right. I am riding this wave. And just putting one foot in front of the other with training, like your, your training after that seemed to have really taken off. I mean, it seemed like it inspired you. You came back, I think, more fired up and really on point. You've been on point ever since. Yes, I've gotten a lot stronger since Worlds last year. Uh, I was definitely fired up, definitely ready to get right back into training. Again, I, I feel like training is my lifestyle. It's I, I don't just train for meets. Mm -hmm. Sure, my training is oriented towards <laughs> powerlifting meets, but training is a part of my lifestyle. Um, so I was looking forward. I don't know. Every time you get to a meet, you kind of look forward to an off season. <laughs> I'm definitely yeah. getting there, especially because there's a real grind of like, even even though we had a little more time between nationals and worlds this year, it's still like a three month turnaround. Yeah. It's three months of prep for a meet, and it's it's intense. Um, yeah. So every time you, every time I compete, I always look forward to the off season as well. It's a cycle. Um, but I had some ideas about, you know, some things that, um, like missing my third squat, uh, it didn't really make sense. But then looking at my videos, I was like, huh, I kind of folded over. So maybe I don't have back strength that I used to, because I used to really be able to grind squats. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Andre and I were like, hmm, maybe it's that conventional strength that you're lacking that you used to have because you used to train conventional deadlifts. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that was like a big gap in my training where I was scared of training conventional um, because just the back history. Yeah. Um, so we were like, hey, you know what? Things are going well. You're not, I had a little bit of pain. I'm not going to lie. Uh, a yeah. little bit of radiating pain, but not as bad as it used to be. Um, and at this point, I know how to manage like pain and injuries, and I know when to step back when I need to. Um, but, you know, felt like conventional was kind of like a missing link. And as I had said earlier in the podcast, I feel like every prep gives you information um, that you can use to optimize for your next prep. So I think the key piece of information that I got from that meet was, I think I'm missing some conventional strength here. Uh, I couldn't grind my third deadlift or sorry, my third squat, third squat just yeah. fold it over. Mm -hmm. So started training conventional and my back is really big now. <laughs> I really put awesome. on some, I really put on some back meat and uh, I also started taking creatine. I was scared of taking creatine because of the, uh, the bloat that oh. I would get. And, mm -hmm. um, that's a big so, st stigma for women taking creatine, I think. Yeah. And it's just uh, water dudes, weight. Dudes start taking creatine in like middle school. Yeah, but, but I mean, um, yeah, for women, like even like trying to convince my sister to take creatine, it's like, it's hard. I mean, I, cause like you yeah. said, it's like the scale is going to go up and that's oftentimes for a lot of people that's when they hear that, it's just like, I don't need to hear anything else. I'm not doing it. Yeah. And I took it a few times and like knew that it, like post post 2022 worlds, mm -hmm. um, I started to do it for three weeks and I'd see the scale go up like six pounds and then be like, uh, I can't do this. Yeah. So I did that like two or three times but now i'm finally okay to suck it up <laughs> mm -hmm. um and yeah so i think again it's just like little optimizations here and there there's yeah. more i could do um so i could take creatine creatine is one of the most heavily researched um you know supplements that are that are um in that are that you can take in a drug tested federation yeah um, yeah that are safe and yeah yeah so yeah. You know, I knew I could optimize my diet a little bit better. Um, yeah, again, just you always get more information and then you try a few new things. And um, so added convention, I would say the, the biggest things we did is we added conventional mm -hmm. and um, I added creatine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I did also develop a little bit of a knee issue. Um, so then adapted to that by adding a lot more single leg types of work. So Ooh. Um, I'd say a lot more overall balanced approach to training and, oh yeah, I would say one more thing is I do my accessories a lot more too. <laughs> I don't skip nice. those. <laughs> yeah. So accessories, conventional creatine and single leg work or mainly the, I'd say the biggest difference between worlds 2022 and nationals 2023. Yeah. And I mean, the other huge difference is 10.5 kilos on your squat and another 
what we're looking at seven and a half on your deadlift um, in comparison from IPF worlds to now. And that's where you're seeing your, you know, that's where your total has shot up 20.5 kilos in that amount of time as well, which put in 20 kilos on your total after like what would be for a lot of people, a career injury, a career ending, you know, back surgery after also being your 10 years in the game, <laughs> those are like newbie games. I mean, yeah, I'm still, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, I mean, you've unlocked some secrets. I mean, anyone who's taking notes, like write this down, do your freaking conventional <laughs> Take your deadlift, creatine you guys. Know. Five rounds yeah, a day. Exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, conventional is a, is, is magic. And uh, so question about that. Cause I'm also, so I lift, I'm tra- a training nerd as well. Um, do you push like heavy singles on conventional do you do like lighter weight stuff do you do more rep work with conventional like how do you how do you program it so again just every training cycle getting more information Mm -hmm. uh we got to a point where we thought that my conventional was stronger than my sumo and i was almost yeah you're gonna literally a week out from nationals 2023 i thought i was gonna pull conventional and uh but i was also training sumo so one way that it improved my training, it, so I went from having two sumo days to having one sumo day, one conventional day. Okay. And, you know, there was also some amount of like doing Romanian deadlifts too. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of like compound accessories. Um, and that was favorable because one, my back was getting stronger, but two, I felt like my hips weren't getting beat up. Mm-hmm. Too much sumo. Uh, I feel like has a diminishing return for me in terms of like just my hips start to get beat up Um, and nobody wants that kind of pain because it also carries over to my squat as well. So I felt like the the balance of the two was just better for me to sustain training and being healthy Um, because a lot of times if you're getting injured, uh, you got to look at your training. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. (laughs) How are you training? So um, one conventional and one sumo day seems to be the sweet spot for me mm-hmm. in terms of just overall staying healthy. Um, and as far as like, what were we doing leading into nationals, um, you know, further out from the meet was just a good amount of volume of both, um, sumo, okay. I was doing like a variation, like pause sumo conventional mm-hmm. I was doing like sets anywhere from six to 10 couple sets wow. for a while and just mm-hmm. progressing that and then um getting closer to the meet we started to prioritize actually we kind of had some tests where we were sort of peaking both of them to see which was stronger mm-hmm. you know doing like heavy heavy triples um working up to like a single at eight and then doing some down sets so you know, the typical types of peaking strategy yeah. when you're like 12 to 16 weeks out from a meet. And it was looking like my conventional was a bit stronger. So then the sumo days ended up being more like supporting days um, okay. where it was just like a couple sets of five pause sumo. Okay. And then um, the conventional days were more of like just, you know, peaking that lift and doing some back sets. Gotcha. So a week out from nationals, uh, I had the, like, you know, a supporting sumo day, if you will. And uh, I had skipped the week before because I was sick. Um, I don't know what happened, but I was just Uh really sick and I just skipped a day at the gym. Again, I know when to back off, I would say. Yeah. So I skipped a week of sumo and it didn't seem like a big deal because sumo was a supporting lift anyway at that point. and then came back, had a supporting sumo day, and everything was flying like crazy. And then I was like, hey, Kristen, um, I'm going <laughs> to do a single. And then I pulled 213. Uh-huh. And I was like, Which whoa, is huge. this is huge. So yeah. then I pulled sumo at the meet. Um, I actually locked out 212 and a half, but then I missed it due to grip. So, yeah, yeah. And now I know, okay, sumo seems to be. 10 to 12 kilos stronger than my conventional in terms of like single strength. So for my training cycle between power, between nationals and worlds, sumo has been the priority lift where conventional kind of became the supporting deadlift. I'm excited because if you basically were considering it like a secondary lift and, you know, even like skip a day and, and then, and then it's like, 
and then it just pops off like that. And I love that it's these little uh, anecdotal things of like this little one-off thing of like you skip today and then you're, you're probably your hips and your recovery and everything just loved that, you know? And yeah. then, and then it's just amazing to see, like, even like when we were just talking at the beginning like coming back from Chicago, maybe you weren't able to push as hard in Chicago on the actual lifting. Yeah. You were wearing yourself out, like outside of the gym. But mm -hmm. then when you got back into the gym, your body was like, Hey, I'm actually pretty fresh and like ready to roll. And like, yeah, boom, PR. so it's just crazy how a sick day could like transform the <laughs> whole all that trajectory. Yeah. 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 I mean, change the whole game for me in nationals. Yeah. And, um, then, and then it's like, in you, but you have to have the ability to see that and to, and to adapt and not to be like, well, no, we already decided conventional is the thing. So we're not going to look at this. That's a fluke. Like don't pay attention. And you and Kristen and Andre, you know, being able to kind of see the writing on the wall and say, okay, let's, let's do this. And then to think like, okay, you did that just a few weeks out. And then you didn't really peak your sumo, like you're going to now for worlds. So right. how exciting so is this? Yeah. So yeah. now I'm using, we're using that information yeah. to peak my sumo for nationals where it's, we're taking a slightly different strategy um, for peaking it for worlds. So again, yeah. it's just like having a good relationship with your coach is important. Being able to, I mean, I don't want to say that everyone, <laughs> I don't want to say that everyone should trust themselves because a lot of times the program is what you should do. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um, be, but I have so enough experience where, yeah, yeah, I have enough experience where I know like there's a certain standard deviation of it doesn't matter. As long as you're within the standard deviation of the training plan, yeah, you're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, uh, yeah, just made that judgment that day where I was like, I know you gave me sets of five, Kristen, but I just did one seventy for five, and it moved like it has never moved before. So I know we're a week out from the meet, but <laughs> let me do this. Yeah, and she's like, all right. Send it. <laughs> go for it <laughs> yeah yeah no, so i mean and i pulled just... almost like t almost uh seven and a half kilos more than i've ever pulled on sumo before so it's like that was the move but it's exciting there's always yeah not to say there's always little opportunities like that but there's always a little bit of flexibility that you have um to work with and programming doesn't always have to be so rigid exactly and again i'm also just exact coming science. from yeah, it's not an exact science. And I'm also coming from a place of, hey, I'm doing this for fun. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, this is so, yeah. And you were feeling um, it and you were feeling it that night. And so you sent it and then you learned something. I sent it. And it's, that's the key thing is, is, you know, you learn something. And I think this is a great story for a lot of the young kids that listen to this. You're in the game for 10 years, you know, and you don't have it all figured out. No one has it a hundred percent all figured out. You know, anyone who tells you that they do is just, they're lying, you know, or that's, that's self, the fun of it. They're deluding themselves, you know, or whatever. If they think that they know absolutely everything you can learn from, from all these little things. And the key is to have a coach and, an, and as an athlete is to be adaptable and to constantly be learning more and not think that, you know, everything, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah. And, um, I've been powerlifting for more than 10 years now and yeah. I've had a few coaches actually Mike to was my coach at one point as well. Uh -huh. Um, and like, you may not have the same coach with you, your whole powerlifting career, but who will you have with you your whole powerlifting career? You yourself. <laughs> yourself. yourself. Yep. Yeah. So be accountable to you. Um, I don't want to say don't rely on your coach. Your coach is supposed to be there to support you through your journey, but ultimately you're accountable to you and use your, if you have a coach, um, use that experience to learn, you know, um, exactly. be, become a student of the sport. If you're going to bother to be in this, like that's part, that's the fun of it. It's yeah. figuring it out. And be a um, collaborator, collaborator with your coach too. You know, it's not just a one way street. It's not just them giving you a program and you blindly follow. It's like, this is a relationship. We go back and forth. We talk. Yeah. I think that's how, that's a good, what a good coach would do. They don't just give out a program and, and just be like, call me in six weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a very collaborative, uh, coaching dynamic with Kristen. Yeah, really like I that. Th 
And I think you see that with super high level athletes in all sports, you know, the, in, 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 in all sports, professional, um, football, basketball, everything like this, the stars, the top level athletes, they're not just, the coach isn't just dictating everything from the top. It is a give and take. It's a relationship. Yeah. And it's more important to have that good communication as the foundation of it than, than really of it in of the X's and O's that'll work itself out over time. Um, if you 100%. have good communication, um, all right, well, getting back into the timeline and stuff. So worlds was awesome. You, you know, you walk away with a gold medal, you're fired up, you're coming into training. You finally are stringing together like consistent programming, consistent training with a really good coach. You know, you got a good support team around you with Andre, your training is going great, all of this. So let's fast forward to bench nationals, 2023. So I just wrote on my notes, chill vibes, question mark, Andre injured. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so how do you feel yeah. going into that? I love bench only meets. Yeah. All you got to do is just show up and hit a few benches. It's great. Show up I mean, I love bench, so. I know I, 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 I don't like it when people call me a bench specialist because I'm not, <laughs> but wow. I do love to bench. Um, so, and that was an important meet for me because of these freaking new elbow death rules, yeah. which I hate. <laughs> Let's get into it. Yeah, exactly. So that was, <laughs> was that your main motivation for doing that? I mean, do you, looks like you had done a, one other bench press nationals before. Yeah, that was or yeah, we just won back in 2015. Yeah, a long time ago. Um I guess it was uh you know, I hadn't done a meet since Worlds and I wanted to do well for Nationals and I felt like it would be a good just practice uh meet see where my bench is. Mm -hmm. Um also I wanted to get my bench judged before um before Nationals. Uh, I wanted to get my bench certified if you will against yeah, the new yeah. rules um and, and this was, uh this was so, january 14th just so people know and the new rule took place january 1st so yeah. this is one of the very first meets with the new new bench rules yeah and frankly my bench is i would say it is good according to the new rules mm -hmm. but depending on the judge it it could it could go either way, frankly, go either way. just yeah. de just depending on how the judge feels about my bench that particular day. Um, so that is something I kind of knew um, just based on the limited information that we had on the new rules. And still to this day. <laughs> and um, still to know, this day. Very vague um, how it's being called. It's, you know, there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of like mis misinformation about it, I would say. Yeah, like, I mean, I've seen some photos from Bench Worlds in this past week or two, and I'm like, that Scared. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's got me a little nervous for Worlds, but anyway, I'll go back to Bench Nationals. Uh, so yeah, that was my goal. Yeah. Get my new bench, get my bench certified under the new rules. Um, also, just tune up. Frankly, I, I still feel like I don't have that many meats under my belt in this recent era of powerlifting, so... Yeah. 2.0. <laughs> um, so I wanted to do another meet and doing a bench meet six weeks out from nationals felt safe in terms of not really complicating my training for nationals. Um, so, and yeah, it was in Reno, Nevada. I was supposed to go with Andre who always handles me every meet. He's handled me every meet since 2013, uh, since my mm -hmm. first meet. I know precious love story. Yeah, uh, he wasn't, this is the first time he wasn't there. And what, why wasn't he there? He blew his knee out in jujitsu the day before we were supposed to fly out. Uh, yeah, he I could remember. not tolerate. Like, I don't think it was a direct flight. I think it was. Uh, I think there was a flight change or yeah. uh, airport change. Yeah, indirect flight. Um, yeah. he there was no way he could he could barely walk. So I could have called off the meet to stay <laughs> here with him, but um, yeah, I just. I just decided to go. I was like, well, I got to go do this meet. So I'll see you. <laughs> see what handle itself. <laughs> Peace out, Andre. Hope the knee feels yeah. better. Uh, catch you on the flip side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then I was like, well, I guess we'll see how I do handling myself. Uh, yeah. I did all right. Mm -hmm. I think I was a bit, I was rather chill and relaxed. I wasn't super intense, but also that was the vibe. So yeah. it was a pretty low, 
low pressure, low stakes meet. Um, and again, I had certain goals. Um, I thought I would win just based on, you know, I got a gold medal at, bench, at Worlds in the bench. Yeah. So I wasn't like, didn't think that I'd be fighting for victory. Um, but I did want to, you know, hit a PR and hit a big bench and yeah. see how it played against the new rules and seemed to be fine. So, and I even looked at photos myself, like from the, the cam- that head judge camera angle. And I'm like, wow, yeah. it looks solid. So yeah. that's my reference. And mm-hmm. also it was a little bit humbling because I think that Alico bench that everyone benches a little less on there. Yeah. Um, so I, it was a nice, like, it, it was good realistic um, bench for me. I yeah. thought I was going to bench maybe like five kilos more than what I did. Um, but I think, again, just details, right? Yeah. <laughs> Part of the fun is figuring stuff out. And I think one of the things I figured out is that people bench less on that really stiff board. Um, yeah. Because I was benching more on the the squishy ER equipment bench. <laughs> and yeah. I, I also bench more on like a rogue bench too. But whenever I get on that Alico bench, it's very humbling. So nice. I think it was a good because I hadn't been training on it. So I think that it was a good realistic, um, this is what you're going to bench on this particular bench. Yeah. So now what do I do? I train on that bench. <laughs> yeah, you got one for your gym. I saw that. <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> you got the Chelsea Savage special over there yeah. at a home barbell. Yep. So um, that's cool. So again, just like figuring out the little details here. Because yeah, I mean, getting stronger is important. But like little details over time, they add up. They add so. up hundred percent. Um, and so you, you put up a one twenty five bench that would, you know, again, spoiler, that's what also what you did at PA Nats, um, which was, you know, huge, it's a huge bench. And then you also won best lifter at, uh, bench press nationals. Right? Oh yeah. You got the sword, I got the right? sword. I got, got the sword. sword. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I thought I remember. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm going to say she got best lifter, but I think, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, I mean, you walk away from that, you got a dub, you had fun. It was, it was pretty chill. Um, you got your bench, you know, the, the stress of like, okay, my bench is, is going to be good enough. I mean, it's going to pass the, it's going to pass the, the new rules. So then that had to make you feel pretty good going into nationals. And so, so I also had like a realistic, again, just a, a realistic, like bench, I thought I was closer to 130, but yeah, because you uh, 125 was my weight. So because you, you tried 127 and a half and you didn't get it, um, and there was some conversation about you know was your elbow depth less? It doesn't that? matter. I didn't get the bench, so <laughs> yes, but still, but um, you know that 127.5, and then and then you come into nationals, and you rightfully take 125 as your third attempt, and you set yeah. everything up to 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 end at 125 as opposed to kind of not knowing where you are and, and swinging for that 127 and missing. Yeah. And also in a full meet, of course, you, um, yeah, you're going to bench a little less than in just a bench only meet because yeah. you you're benching after you hit a big squat. Exactly. So, um, you know, That's just kind of knowing that it was only a six week turnaround. You're not going to get much stronger in six weeks. Um, so yeah, yeah I was happy with 125, um, and at, it, bench, I think, at, at know, nationals. And you open two and a half kilos left less, you know? And so I think it just basically played out to where like your bench strategy of like, where you're going to open, where you're going to end, um, was all kind of squared away. And you had a pretty good yeah. idea of what that was going to be going into bench nationals. Or into, and that's uh, the value nationals. in just doing tune-up meets, like get yeah. more information. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. that's been a, a theme of the podcast so far is just like, get that information and then use it. You yeah. Know? Like don't just go and do the same attempts again. Yeah, um, and miss one twenty seven point <laughs> five again, and tax yourself, you know, extra that you don't need to. So yeah. Um. All right. So going into then to into PA Nats, um, people weren't twenty twenty three, twenty twenty three round two. So yeah. So people were not picking you to win, but spoiler alert again, you did. Um. So how are you feeling going into it? Do you have a little chip on your shoulder? I mean, you're the bench press national champion. You're you know, <laughs> fifth place in the world um, on the previous uh, world's world championship um, IPF world's team. How, yeah, how are you feeling? Were you feeling slighted? Would you have a chip on your shoulder? <laughs> um, again, a lot of experience in the sport. Yeah. I've been around to know I've been around long enough to see it play out many times where 
someone who's projected to win doesn't win. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, I, I've just seen so many different outcomes at meets uh, that were not predicted. So just because other people were predicting what they were going to predict doesn't didn't have any bearing on the actual outcome of the meet. Mm-hmm. Maybe it did in, the, in a psychological sense of, I don't know, maybe my competitor was overconfident. Um, who knows? Like Maybe I, you had a little chip on your shoulder. Um, maybe psychologically, I had a little chip on my so- shoulder. I don't know if I would attribute my really good performance to having a chip on my shoulder. I'd attribute my, I would attribute my good performance <laughs> to preparation and execution and game day. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, so but it's those little things, like you said, the little things that add up of just like, you get you fired up. Like you, sometimes you go into the gym on one of these days, like your secondary, um, alternate sumo day or whatever. And you hear a podcast and they're like, not really, they're not giving you the credit you deserve. <laughs> and you just go in there just this much more fired up. Maybe it's even subconscious. Yeah. Like you said, those little tiny things start to add up over time. They talk about this in sports all the time. Like when one team like talks shit about the other team they to give them that that's like locker room material where they'll like put it up on the locker room. Like they're doubting us They're in the, every time you come in and out of the gym, you're thinking to yourself, like there, you know, you have something to prove basically mm-hmm. just to do that. Like 0.0001% extra, like a little bit of fire. I'm sure uh, there was some effect. Like I listened to some podcasts and you know, some, I, I remember someone saying, Oh, I don't see Chelsea like having a chance at like the, whatever the total was, uh, the, the Carpino one there that was another thing I had to get a certain total right like yeah I don't see her close to that like I saw I, I definitely heard some of that stuff and there was definitely I'm sure there was a subconscious effect on just definitely. like a little extra fire like I'm gonna prove yeah. them wrong it's good to prove people wrong but uh I also knew like I don't like to post my big lifts leading into meets because mm-hmm. actually for multiple reasons um one is you I don't really want to show all my cards. Um, two, I feel like it kind of sets you up in a way for having to meet that in a meet. Yeah. Um, like Which is not the same. Training training is not the same as meet day, right? Yeah. I just, I want the meet day to count more than the training days. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's great to hit a PR in the gym. Love hitting PRs in the gym. But what does it matter if I pull 220 in the gym if I don't even pull 210 at the beat. Um, exactly. So I feel like on a, again, just like little psychological things, I've found that when I don't post my my big lifts um, just on a psychological level, it makes me feel like, like, okay, meet day is what counts. Mm-hmm. It just reemphasizes that point. Again, just little details, little yeah. psychological things that I notice. Um, so, Wait, so you do, you do, I wouldn't say hide, but you don't, you don't post like maybe like top singles, stuff like this, because you definitely post a lot of PRs, like yeah. rep PRs. I post rep and, PRs. Yeah. Um, but like the validation that I'm looking for is from meet day. I'm yeah. not looking for validation from my singles in the gym. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I want, I love that. I want it to, I just like want the weight of the, I, it's just a matter of like relative weight of importance. Um, yeah. And I try to, you know, I, I try to balance the seesaw towards the, towards prioritizing the meet day performance mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and little sure. psychological things. So how did the day unfold? I mean, I, I remember um, you seemed pretty nervous the morning of the competition for sure, which I think everyone normally is. Um, but how did it, how did the day unfold for you? I mean, I had a plan and I executed it to a T. Uh-huh. That was it. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. That was it. Um, I knew that I didn't think that I really had much more than the Carpino one total, but I thought that based on everything that I did in, in the gym, that I could get that Carpino one total, the 522.5. 522.5, yeah. And then that was going to be the best shot that I had. And um, whether Claire's I was who I expected to be my primary competitor, um, I expected her to 
I don't know. You go into a meet and you expect your competitors to have their best meet. Oh, yeah. Don't go into a meet expecting your competitors to not have a good meet. Um, so there was actually something that Sam Calhoun texted me in the morning of that, like, I felt like really resonated with me. She said, go out there and fight for every kilo. Every, every kilo has to be earned. And I was like, that's right. I love so that. then uh, I thought about that. My whole meet, every kilo has to be fought for. Um, you're not entitled to anything going well. You're not entitled to this going well. You have to make it go well. And uh, that's what I did. So that was I, uh, yeah. And I got really close to that Carpino one total, just uh, slipped the grip on the third deadlift, which, yeah. again, more information. I hadn't had a grip issue um, since I re-entered powerlifting. Maybe my deadlift was just not strong enough to like lose it due to grip. Yeah. But again, optimizing during training. I'm doing heavy holds now. Um, so just more information uh, that I'm using for um, prepping for worlds. But yeah, and then my competitor, like there was Claire, mm -hmm. whatever she did, it was like, I don't know. It's not, we don't compete in a, in a sport where like I'm in direct combat. <laughs> I mean, yeah. in a way that I am, but also it's just like, I can't control anything but my own performance. So I just focused on that. You you were zoned in. I mean, it, it definitely, like, you were focused. I remember talking to you, you seemed nervous, like, in the morning of, um, which which you, it, from bench nationals, obviously, it was, like, so much more chilled out. Um, so I was like, oh, this is, like, a little bit different kind of Chelsea we have here. Because um, you definitely seem, and I remembered you were pretty fired up at PA Nats the previous year. Um, but, um, I was like, okay, but then, yeah, I mean, as thinking about, as the day unfolded, you just seemed extremely zoned in and, and actually pretty chill during the actual competition itself. I think once, once it got underway, probably the, the nerves went down a little bit. I think generally speaking that happens after squat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you went squat is still a squat. squat is still a stressful lift for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once that's over, everything else seems like a walk in the park. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You um, seem pretty chilled out. So, so yeah, as far as the chilled out, like it's really just the, again, I'm here to have fun. It doesn't have to go well. I'll be okay if it doesn't go well. So I, I do kind of, I, I have relieved myself of that pressure of, I have to, I have to do well. Yeah. It doesn't have to go well. It's okay. Yeah, it may be your last meet. And if it is, you've been through it before, you'll be okay. Um, so yeah, I have that pressure relief on myself. I think that really helps. Um, I'm here for fun. And uh, but also you gotta fight for every kilo. So yeah. you've been working so hard. Show it on the now's the time to show it. Um, you don't show it on social media, so now's the time to show it. And you had um, you, you had a really good squad. Right. I mean, Bill McCarthy, game day coaching. He's one of the best of all time. You got Andre there as well. You're in. I don't Austin. know if people know this about Bill, but mm. he used to be at SSPT. And so I'm pretty sure he's absorbed the full Matt and Susie Gary game day methods. 100%. He's really good. Yeah. He's definitely like top three in all game day coaches that you could have. And then yeah. you had Andre there as well, who's recovered from the knee by this time. <laughs> yeah. right, Not fully. Uh, Not fully, but he was enough. compromised. Um, but and you're in Austin as well, too, which is kind of yeah. Nice I had a lot place. of a lot of things that were going for me for sure. Yeah. So it would have been silly to count me out. Um, so which I didn't. I, didn't. <laughs> I know you didn't, Paul. I didn't. I just want that on the record, uh, by the way. Um, and I'm not um, counting you out for worlds either. So, um, I thank think, you. I think uh, you're going to shock some people when it's sh showing up in Malta. Yeah, but yeah, we'll talk about that next. Yeah. So let's, let's jump into that. Is there anything, or is there anything else that you want to say? I mean, so uh, about nationals, this is your first national championship win since it is. going all the way back to 2013 where I won junior nationals, junior nationals. So, I mean, it, pretty cool. 10 years later, <laughs> yeah. you rarely see 
really high level junior talent um transfer over into the open and mm. become you know national champions in both like i i wonder i wonder how many we could count i don't off the top of my head i don't know mm. um very many I, I haven't thought about that but it obviously took me a while <laughs> takes 10 i took years. second many times yeah, i took second good. at open nationals many times it's a good um, lesson to these kids that are about to go possibly win a junior national championship this year, like get ready for another decade of work <laughs> before you're going to get the open one. Yeah. It's a lot harder to get that open title. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that was a lifetime goal. Mm -hmm. Um, so I finally got that open national title. feels really good. I can say that forever. Worked really so hard happy. for it. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, it will be my third Worlds, of course. And this time I will have gotten it not by as an alternate, but like getting that spot. Yeah. So. And then as the national champ. Yeah. Didn't get the Carpino one to secure it, but I knew I had a pretty good chance based on my performance and yeah. getting the title. So, yeah, I felt really good about that. Of course, even if I didn't, you know, still put 20 kilos in my total in one year, um, not even a year. Uh, yeah. So. I was, yeah, it was, I felt like it was my breakout performance. Like in 2017, again, I felt like my, uh, my ceiling was higher than what I had gotten to express in powerlifting yeah. meets, but it was cut short. So I still feel like I'm not at my ceiling yet. Um, but I finally feel like I broke past where I was, um, mm -hmm. in 2017. So yeah, that was a, I would say it was a confidence building meet. Um, it was my best meet to date um, in my whole powerlifting career. Um, open national title, uh, mm -hmm. almost nine for nine, <laughs> had nine for yeah. nine in my hand. Um, you locked it out. Yeah. And again, just doing better each, doing a little better each time. So what am I doing now? I'm focusing a bit more on grip strength and between nationals and now, uh, keeping up with the accessories and the single leg work, haven't had the knee issue pop up. Um, I don't want to say I'm deprioritizing conventional, but I'm prioritizing sumo as my uh, primary deadlift and then conventional is the supporting. So um, yeah, just, just some adjustments that we've made and I'm training on an Alico bench. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, let's see, what else have we changed? Actually, I'm now only squatting two days a week instead of three. Okay. Um, we felt like three was too much. I was always kind of just always in a state of having a lot of fatigue. So yeah. again, just making some adjustments and uh, should be better next time. For sure. Um, so, I mean, you, you're just basically like running back the same, you got the same coach you've got, you've had the same, you know, coaches. Andre is like a, been a rock, you know, consistent there for a long time. You've learned all these little things you're putting it all together. So going into worlds 2023, I think if anyone's paying attention, they should expect the best Chelsea Savitt we've ever seen by that is, that is the goal <laughs> by a ways. Um, yeah. and we're looking at, um, let's, let's look forward here to Malta. We're two weeks out, roughly two and a half. Um, you're nominated in fourth with a 515.5. And I mean, there's some pretty stiff competition in this, in this weight class. You've got arguably the greatest power lifter in the world right now, Leah Bavlo in your weight class. Um, and then you've got Marta Jenner and, um, there's a lifter here from Georgia in here as well. And then, you know, like Clara Perot last year finished ahead of you. She's, she's nominated in six. Sarah Naldi, a junior from the 63s is coming up to the, to the, uh, you know, to the 69s. So it's a stacked class. I mean, 69s are, are loaded around the world. Yeah. And as I said, the, the nominating total that I had last year had me seated at sixth. This year, it's when I have good lift up right now. It would have yeah. me at 13th. Yeah. So the depth is everyone in that, in the primetime session that I'm going to be in is nominated with more than a 500 total. Um, more, than, more than 505, 507 is the worst one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's crazy. Everyone's getting stronger. Everyone's working really hard. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be fun. I, uh, I think, uh, Chelsea 1.0 might have been scared, uh, intimidated, 
by just kind of the depth of talent getting stronger. Um, but I think that me now is just like, oh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> I love it. Because when you're having uh, fun, you you have success. So yeah, they should they should be worried. Yeah, you're having fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've got five fifteen point five, but you can't count out someone who's got a five thirteen or a five ten beneath me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, um, five five thirteen with Sarah Naldi. She's young. Um, yeah. So like, I mean, she's definitely gonna put kilos on, and you definitely have as well. So. Yeah. You know, even, even, uh, this woman in, uh, from Georgia, that's got a 525 um, nominated in third, right above you there. She should be watching out because I don't mean to know. talk shit. I don't know if that's a real nominating total. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen any meat from her at 69, uh, with that total. And, you know, you know, we can dig for this information than we yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we will. Uh, every place so, matters. Yeah. I think she's only competed in 76 actually. So but anyway, you know, not to fixate on single competitors, but I think a previous self would have been really intimidated. Um, but my current self is excited. Yeah. Uh, I That's think it's cool that the the depth of the talent in the sport is getting, you know, it, it, it a rising tide lifts all ships. Yep. It, I have to, I, I can't just coast my way to the podium. Like I really have to work for it. And I'm that much more entrenched in the process physically and mentally. And um, just, you know, it makes me do better. Yeah. It makes me strive. It, make, it makes me reach higher and strive to do better. So I'm definitely at a point where I don't, I'm not intimidated by the competition. I'm there. I deserve to be there. Um, yeah. So. I love it. You're fired up. You're, you're going to do something. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's. I'm just so excited for you. It's going to be. Amazing. Oh, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate it. It's going to be amazing. I mean, being completely honest, I think I have a genuine shot at the podium um, and, and I really want it. Uh, but again, it's OK if I don't. It's OK yeah. if I I'll be OK if it doesn't work out. Um, my best total to date is 515 and a half. I might t total 530 and not get on the podium. You know, am I going to be upset? Yeah. I'm not gonna be upset. Why no, would I be upset? You, yeah, you're gonna PR. You're gonna have a PR total for sure. Um, yeah, and it's gonna be all the more sweeter if you do get on that podium, like you said, um, with with just the depth of competition here, and it, like you said, not taking it for granted um, that you're just not gonna cakewalk your way onto the podium in the 69 kilos of the world championships. So it's just that's just not happening. Yeah, so, I'm gonna show up it, there and fight for every kilo. Exactly, and if you get on that podium, it will be something truly special. So. Um, yep. I'm looking, I'm pumped for you. Um, all right. I want, I, there's one more topic I want to bring up, um, and ask you about, and then we'll hit into some quick hitter questions and we'll wrap this up. Okay. Um, so when you hired Kristen as a coach, I want to talk about women, you know, coaching and powerlifting a little bit. Um, so you mentioned before when we talked, you know, kind of at the beginning that you specifically wanted to hire a woman. And I just want to go, what is your take on women coaches and powerlifting, and why they face, it seems like they face like such an uphill battle as coaches. Um, I've talked about this with Meg Scanlon. I've talked about this with a couple other athletes on the podcast. And it kind of stems from just a general observation of there's not that many women coaches when you go, look around in a warm up room um, in, in Austin. And um, th this conversation came up at high school nationals um, where I was at earlier this year. And one of the women coaches, Janelle Brown, she just noticed not a lot of women in here um, as coaches. So what's your take on the whole, um, you know, this whole topic of women coaching and powerlifting? Um, so again, been around 10 years. I've yeah. been a coach myself. Uh, I coach anyone who specifically um, comes to me and wants to be coached. I used to have a little coaching company um, uh -huh. with Natalie Hansen, actually, and a few other female coaches because we cared about this issue. Um, yeah. kind of stopped doing that because again, I exited the world of powerlifting and was burnt out. Um, but this has always been a thing, at least that I've seen since 2013. And I, I'm sure that it's been ever since before, prior to that as well. Yeah. Um, I think things are getting better. I think we see more female coaches, but, um, I don't want to make generalizations, but, um, you know, in general, in the workplace, 
um, women are not rewarded for displaying confidence and women are not rewarded for um, being assertive and being confident and yeah. sure of themselves and, you know, very in, in a strong way, marketing their capabilities, like having a loud mouth. Mm -hmm. um, women are powerlifting or not in, in the world, <laughs> politics, yeah. corporate America, the corporate world, anywhere where women are working, they're not rewarded for those, um, for displaying those types of qualities. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think on a societal level, women have internalized to not um, display those sort of qualities of advertising themselves heavily um, mm -hmm. and displaying a certain self-assurance and confidence. Um, not to say that women aren't confident, but we're not rewarded in the marketplace for displaying those traits. And I think that we see that playing out, you know, it, it it's in the it's in the business world, yeah. it's in academia, it's in society, it's in politics. And if it's in all those places, it's gonna be in powerlifting coaching as well. Yeah. And um, for a very long time, powerlifting was a very male dominated sport. Um, I, I don't know the numbers now. Uh, I think it's getting better uh, mm -hmm. as far as female participation in powerlifting. So I think there's a certain just like historical aspect of yeah. male participation in powerlifting is ha, has been going on longer uh, than female participation. Not to say that women weren't participate, participating in powerlifting for a long time, but it's just the 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 amount, <laughs> the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I do think that in terms of coaching, people tend to find a coach that they can relate to. And I don't have numbers on this; purely anecdotal. But I can surely say that more women come to me than men for coaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I do think there's an aspect of like is attracted to like, um, where no, the gender of your coach shouldn't matter <laughs> in terms of like their ability to be a good coach for you and a good confidant. But I do think that there's a, um, uh, I don't want to say what it is, but I think that there's a certain like, a, like is attracted to like, a tendency. Um, yeah, a tendency in people to just hire someone who they can relate to. Um, so I think men are going to be more likely to hire men. Women are going to be more high, likely to hire women. I think there's that at play. I think yeah. there's some historical aspect where because of that trend um, and there just being more men in strength sports and powerlifting that we just see that there's more male coaches and men hiring yeah. men hiring men um and then of course just the the marketing aspect of as well where again women are not um rewarded for um having confidence on display and yeah. um and displaying just their yeah their confidence yeah. so we don't do it as much. <laughs> we don't. Uh, we don't go on social media and sell, sell, sell. Yeah. Um, whereas I think that men tend to do that more confidently because they're rewarded for that. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a really good. That's a really good understanding of the issue. Um, I always think about like off the top of my head, like you name some women coaches, and you're thinking like you know Sam Calhoun and um, Susie Gary and you know some of these legends. Um, on the other hand, on the men's side, when you think of top five, top 10 coaches in the world, um, even top, top coaches that are coaching at Power of the American Nationals and stuff like this, you don't have the elite level talent in terms of their lifting ability. Um, so like Susie Gary is like, you know, whatever million time world champion and, and all of this. And, you know, Kristen Dunsmore, multi-time national champion, Sam Calhoun, same thing. Um, uh, but a lot of male coaches, they don't they've never been a national champion and yet they make it to the highest levels as coaches. Um, it seems like, I think that there's a, a higher standard placed on women to be extremely good power lifters before they can get 
the respect of being a coach, um, which we all know you don't have to be a great powerlifter to be a coach. You don't have to be completely a completely different skill set. <laughs> you don't have to be a good football player to be a good football coach, right? Like so one of some a of the lot best of, football players. Yeah. A lot of athletes are not good coaches. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, different skill set. Certainly but yeah. there's that tendency in our sport too, to be like, Oh, this person's strong. So let me hire them. But, yeah. um, but yeah, what's your, what are your feelings on that? I think that's an interesting observation that I haven't really noticed myself, um, where <laughs> I don't want to say average dudes become coaches and then people. Hire them. Yeah. But I yeah. guess I'll say, it. yeah, let's say it. I mean, exactly. Um, <laughs> you see that you definitely see that less often with women, um, yeah. when they're held to a higher standard. I, I would say that's, yeah, I, I would agree with that. And again, uh, alluding back to when I when I started talking about hiring Kristen, January 1st, 2022, yeah. my list was really short yeah. of people I wanted to hire. And, and provided, I'm like a unique case, right? I competed at the world championships. So if anything, my standards for a coach are probably higher than yeah. should be for the average, than the average person or even intermediate lifter should have, I would say. Totally. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting observation. But um, again, a force that you see play out in other, yeah, in, in other really. realms as well, in other worlds as well, where kind of an average dude seems to rise up, <laughs> yes. and women are held to a much higher standard. I mean, I don't know if you watch Succession, but <laughs> oh yeah, great show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that satirizes what we see in reality. Um, Definitely. Um, so yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, all right. and well, even if you look at like podcasters or even teams of coaches, yeah. it's not uncommon. It's literally all dudes. Yeah. Um, inclusion should be, in inclusion needs to be intentional. And that's one thing that you did. Like you mentioned that you specifically wanted to hire a woman coach. Yeah. Uh, inclusion has to be intentional. More people have to have that attitude or else these things aren't going to change yeah even coaching teams like uh i'm not going to call out any specific i just don't yeah. want to do that but in, again inclusion not only you know female but uh or for women but people of people of color yeah. um right like uh companies and you know, different worlds where if you're not intentional about inclusion, then there's not going to be inclusion in representation. Exactly. We're just going to so, drift right back to the average, what we've been doing. Exactly. And I don't think that in the strength world, like there's as much, we're a little less regulated in terms yeah. of like, we're not, we don't operate in, we do operate like the business world, but we also don't. Yeah. In the business world, we'll, we'll see uh, like, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, um, mm -hmm. people who are, um, who are dedicated to intentional inclusion and intentional representation. Mm -hmm. And we need more of that in strength sports. So Definitely. me, my choice to hire a woman coach was intentional because I know about just the, the lack of, um, that, that people are not as intentional like that. And, you know, it, it comes, I'm, I'm a consumer, if you will. I'm a consumer yeah. who cares about intentional inclusion. Um, but we need to see it more at a, a sport level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard in sports um, because it's not like we're, we can really regulate our athletes and like, oh, we need to hire this many uh, different types of coach or this or that. It's, it's loose. We're like a loosely organi organized activity, you know? And so as opposed to like a company can hire a diversity inclusion person to make that their top priority, federations possibly could do that. Um, you know, the IPF level, power in America level. Um, but yeah, I mean, it all really kind of stems from like, you, this is going to be a more consumer bottom up consumer driven approach where the people who are buying coaching services are have to make that intentional decision of like hire a woman. And I do think that having it's one thing, yes, that women are held to this much higher standard where you have to basically be like a world champion, world-class level lifter to like really develop like a really good clientele, uh, coaching, uh, coaching business. But those pioneers that are doing that are proving that women can be great coaches 
And then maybe we start to see some women crack into, you know, having successful coaching businesses that are not world champions or that are not like multi-time national champions or, you know, things like this. So it just starts with, you know, from the consumer, you know, people like yourself making these choices and, and then, uh, seeing the success and then it catches on from there, hopefully. Hopefully. So, all right. Well, um, we've been going forever here, so let me get sorry. To I know some... you wanted to keep this short. No, it's okay. I warned they always, you. <laughs> they always go along. I love it. Um, let's do some quick get to know you questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. All right. Okay. All right. So question number one, have you ever been to new Haven? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Where'd you, why'd you, why'd you go there? <laughs> I graduated from college there, uh, Yale University. Actually, one sad thing is I'm missing my 10-year reunion. Oh, why? Because you're in Malta? Yep. Oh, wow. That's awesome. It's actually this weekend. It's technically the weekend before I leave, but frankly, it's just too much. But I, yeah. So spent people, a lot of time in New Haven, Connecticut. So people that are um, pretty, that are humble and they don't want to brag about the fact that I went to Ivy League, Yale University. Um We'll often just be like, yeah, I went to New Haven. Um, like, like you don't want to <laughs> brag. It's like a humble flex a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I went to Yale. I Yeah. Uh, great school. Uh, it was tough. Yeah. yeah. Ego and death. Weren't you on band and gymnastics? I was on the gymnastics team my freshman year. Uh-huh. And then after that, I joined the marching band and saxophonist and yeah i don't know just focused on my education yeah yeah no um, i just want people to like this sport is so diverse you know we have people who graduated from southern illinois university and we have people that graduate from yale right and so it's like i actually have, uh i joined my between. college club powerlifting team at yale that's how i first got into powerlifting wow that's amazing so yeah thank you, yale. yeah and i hear that like the Ivy League schools have their own like powerlifting meets now. Oh, so yeah, I, I'm hearing that it's growing. So that's pretty cool. We got to get them into university nets. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Yale, you know, it's obviously a place for really smart people, hard work, uh, hard workers, everything like that. But if you're looking at the 69 kilo class, it's like the smartest class on the planet. I mean, <laughs> You, I haven't dug into people. That, I've only dug into people's totals. <laughs> but, but I haven't dug like into their educational history. But it's you. I mean, Claire Zai is super smart, like as well, like going to be a doctor. Um, Kristen Dunsmore, you know, we're talking like she's like, uh, is she doing a PhD right now? And she's also, um, you know, with this AI technology. Yeah, and evolve she's AI. like a, a thought leader, right? Uh, a tech leader. And then Kelsey McCarthy, um, who also competed in 69 uh, in the open at Austin is a doctor. So I'm just like, you guys, you don't want to, if you, if you're going to pick out someone, a uh, weight class to do a spelling bee with, definitely don't pick the 69s. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> they're dangerous. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have a ton of respect for my competitors. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, uh, yeah, a rising tide lifts all ships. I mean, yeah. but yeah, you you can have a big bench and you can have a big brain. <laughs> uh, definitely. And that's that's one thing I like to highlight on this get to know you section is just like <laughs> the diversity of people we have in powerlifting. It's not just a stereotypes. It's not just, we got everything. Every, every type of person from all walks of life are in powerlifting, which is cool. That's yeah. one thing that's really cool about it. It's a great um, community. Uh, yeah. So next question, what's your day job? So I work at Accenture. Uh, it's a large consulting firm and I am a manager and I do technology implementations. So specifically, I focus on the software called Workday. Uh, Workday is a platform that a lot of big companies use to manage their workforce. And I'm essentially a product specialist and they put me on these projects and client decides they wanna get Workday. They send me as part of the nice. project team. Nice. So I've been doing that a pretty long time, uh, almost 10 years now. Okay. So as long as you've been doing- Since power- I graduated from college, essentially. My first job out of college was a workday consulting job. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So super smart. Um, and where do you train? What's your home gym? Uh, my home gym is called Home Barbell Club. 
It's right. in Pflugerville, which is a suburb of Austin. Um, okay. And they opened up July 1st of last year, and they're an awesome gym. And anyone who comes in, who comes by Austin should check them out. All right. And where did you grow up? Uh, Long Island, New York. All right, New Yorker. What was the, your first sport? First sport? Yeah. Cheerleading. Cheerleading. I love it. You're not the first one who's mentioned that. Really? First sport. No, I can't remember who else did, but someone else mentioned it as well. Mm. Nice. And then uh, the way that I got into gymnastics from cheerleading is I wanted to be the flyer, like the one that they throw up and who does all uh, the flips and stuff. But they put me as the back spot at uh, the age of like four years old. You were strong. Wow. That I was, was I was strong then. Wow. <laughs> they wanted me to throw people. This and is then where... I was like, I should have known. My parents should have known. Okay. Put her in a weightlifting. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, um Gymnasts tend to have really good benches. I've noticed like Joy Reinfleisch is a, is a, uh, was a gymnast as well. She's a massive mm. bench. Um, and Meg Scanlon was a gymnast. Um, so yeah, there's, it definitely tends, I think to develop, you know, upper body strength more than like, obviously like maybe like soccer or something, some other sports, maybe gymnasts who get into powerlifting. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's a selection effect that the ones that get into it are just happen to also be super strong. Upper yeah. Body. Um, the conditioning that gymnasts do is unlike any other sport, I would say. Yeah. Um, and the upper body, the focus on the upper body conditioning as well is, uh, quite a bit. I mean, I was doing sets of 10 pull-ups at the age of five. Yeah. Um, so there was definitely a, a foundation there, I would say. Um, yeah. And if you want to get into like women and strength sports, there's definitely some, just like you see trends over time and like what is preferred uh as far as like women's proportions go over time right mm -hmm. and i think that even to this day like having a strong upper body as a woman is not seen as something desirable yeah um it's if anything upper body strength is very much underemphasized for um women in fitness in general lower yeah. body strength having a big butt, having big legs, that's become the beauty standard, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so now you see a lot of women getting into the gym and doing lower body programs, but the emphasis on upper body is still not there. Um, so I think we got to celebrate big ventures, women yeah. who bench a lot. I think we got to celebrate them more. We absolutely do. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, all right. So when you're not powerlifting, what's your idea of a good time? So like when I'm not in the gym, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what? Um, like like if you could, like, because you know when you're in prep and stuff, you can't really. You're probably not thinking like we're two and a half weeks out. Like what you would, but like you know what's like your. If if you could turn off powerlifting for like a month and like go do something, what would you do? Uh, I I really like physical activity. Uh, it's just makes me feel good. Um, I would say for a long while, like I was very physically limited. So if anything, I relish it more now. Uh, I really love to dance. So um, I, I've been dancing. It's funny. I hired Kristen January 1st, 2022 for powerlifting. This year, I actually hired a dance coach. Um, so I've been dancing relatively consistently now. Uh, I've kind of been doing it um, on and off for years, ever since my back surgery, actually. Um, I got into... I mean, I had a little bit of a dance background with the gymnastics and stuff, mm -hmm. but um, never like really focused on it intentionally. Uh, but this year, I was like, I'm going to be more intentional about this and try to dance at least twice a week. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Yeah, so, I've seen it. I've seen it. You've been posting it. It's good. Yeah, I love it. Cool. Um, so yeah, I love to dance. I love going on hikes. Uh, I'm not really a water person. I don't really like to go swim or <laughs> I like okay. the beach, but I'll sit on the beach. Um, so yeah, I mean, taking time off, I just like to dance, relax, read, um, just basic stuff. Mm -hmm. I like to eat, really like to eat. <laughs> You're a foodie. I am a foodie. Yeah. I am a, I am a food seeker. Very, yeah very food driven person uh so like you like traveling too i do like to travel yeah yeah mostly for food exploration yeah yeah 
So right, well, yeah, dining and dancing. <laughs> dining and dancing. That's awesome. <laughs> um, okay, the next one. Do you prefer mountains or beaches? Oh. Or neither? I like them both. Okay. I like them both. Oh, both. Uh, both. Depends on the season. All right. Mountains um, in the winter. You like the snow capped mountains? Yeah. Mountains in the winter and beach in the summer. Nice. There's a season mm-hmm. for everything. Yeah. Um, what's do you have a nickname? Uh what do people call you? I guess people call me Chels sometimes. Chels? Okay. Yeah. What's up, Chels? All right, what's That's up? That's fine. Chels? But you have to ask me first. Oh okay. I don't like it when I don't like it when people just at, just call me Chels out of the blue. Uh huh. Please ask first. Okay, can I call you Chels? Name. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I probably never will, but but yeah. uh, um, okay. I was I was looking for something like the Terminator or or uh, something. oh okay Chels. Sometimes okay. I refer to myself as a cyborg. Cyborg, that's right. I I think I have seen you uh, use that before. I've got that in my Insta bio. Okay, that must be where I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, who's a person that you look up to in powerlifting? You can name a couple if you want. Um, I look up to my coach. I look up to Kristen. Yeah. Um, really just accomplished and, you know, she's a great coach and uh, I think she's an awesome person. Really look up to her. All right. um, I'm going to focus on women, I guess. Yeah. Uh, definitely, I really look up to people who have longevity and who have been at the top for a long time. So, mm-hmm. Kim Walford, Jen Thompson, Susie Cartwig, Gary, uh, Bonica Brown, Heather yeah. Connor, like people who have been at the top of the game for a long time. That's what I think that's really special. Um, people who could just do it for a long time. Marissa Inda. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, so I named a few. So there you go. No, that's a great list. That's a great <laughs> list. All right. What's your favorite sport to watch? If powerlifting any. powerlifting yeah all right can't help but like want to watch the sport that you know a lot about and yeah. actually keep up with For sure. i do like to watch gymnastics too again it's just like stuff that i've done i can relate to oh i'd really like to watch olympic weightlifting actually yeah that's fun I to actually, watch i watched a meet uh, olympic weightlifting recently and i kind of kind of got into it a little bit yeah i saw um weightlifting world championships were in Houston in 2015 and uh drove down and watched it for a few days it was freaking awesome Ooh, that's cool yeah uh all right next one who's your favorite football team oh, pass <laughs> <laughs> all right I don't do football okay I good. Don't care. Right. great answer I love that uh what's your favorite music genre we only have a couple more here oof I have an appreciation for lots of genres of music because Mm -hmm. i used to play i used to play saxophone yeah Yeah. so i would say oh man i'm pretty flexible when it comes to music being completely honest okay i like pop i like i like glam rock i like heavy metal i like r&b i like rap uh i'm actually quite flexible when it comes to my music palette i really like classical music too listen to piano watch a symphony uh jazz watch like a live lat watch a latin band actually the that. most recent live music i saw was these two saxophonists who have like traffic cones in their saxophone which ends up that. acting as like an amplifier uh that was so that was so awesome i love seeing great instrumentalists so mm-hmm. yeah moon hooch I think people who used to play instruments and stuff or played in bands and stuff just kind of have that overall appreciation for music. Like you understand a little bit more of what goes into it. Um, even, even just pop stuff and, and obviously appreciate, appreciate more like instrumental stuff more than your average person who doesn't have that background. So, yeah, I definitely like pay attention to the instrumentals in general. Yeah. Um, so All right. yeah. Who's your favorite rapper? 50 cent 50 cent wow you really had that one ready didn't you <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you told me that one was coming i had to think about that one again uh, a pretty flexible music pretty flexible music palette but 50 yeah. cent just reminds me of my youth i love that yeah me too i love 50 um 
what's your favorite mu- movie genres? <sighs> Again, another flexible palette, okay. but I really like comedies. Rice. The levity. Old school Adam Sandler is probably my favorite. Oh, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> I think you and Meg Scanlon same, said, said the same thing. Like, really? Old, like Happy Gilmore, Billy Madison stuff. Uh, Waterboy. Yeah. The hot Chick. Um, that's awesome. Happy Gilmore, Billy Madison, Little Nicky, Big Daddy. Yeah. I love it. I love it. What do you think of his latest? Like, uh, I forget what the, there was a basketball one and then there was a diamond store one or something the jeweler i forget the i haven't name of it. seen i don't think i've seen recent recent stuff yeah. let's check it out there's one where he's like a basketball scout i forget it's like for the love of the game or something like that is the name hmm. of it and then there's one uh there's one where he plays like this jeweler type i want to i forget this I, I i'm bad at remembering names of stuff but yeah check I'll out Adam Sandler's imdb and check out his recents ones he's okay. play, they're more serious basically um, okay. they're, not, they're not the like happy Gilmore, Billy Madison type, you know, goofy goofball stuff. I love the goofball stuff. Yeah. And I'd also say goofball stuff like old school Ben Stiller as well. Oh yeah. I love that. Zoolander, Dodgeball. Ugh. Oh, Zoolander. Great comedy special, satires. Special place in my heart for Zoolander. All right. Um, Last thing is who do you want to, who would you like to thank and any sponsors or anything that you want to shout out? Uh, lots of people. Um. I mean, I shouted out my coach, but yeah. I have a, I have a coaching squad now, if you yeah. will. Yeah. Big time. Uh, Kristen's been awesome. Been awesome. Um, Andre has been there since day, day one. He helps me pick weights in the gym. He sticks it out for my multiple hours long training sessions. He's uh he's an amazing supporter. I'm so lucky. Um, I hired Kedrick. He's awesome too. Mm-hmm. Really helping me uh, just ease some ease some nerves around nutrition, I would say. Um, and again, just talking powerlifting, like Bill McCarthy has been an amazing influence on me as well, even though I really only have had him as a in a coaching context. Um, on game day, like he's still someone that like hypes me up and, uh, you know, even in nationals, he, I, re- I remember, I don't remember what he said, but there were a few times where I felt like he said the right thing, yeah, just the right thing I needed to hear. Um, so he's awesome too. Even the Powerlifting America coaches, uh, their support has been really awesome. Um, mm-hmm. Rodney and Mike, uh, they've been, you know, I've been sending Rodney some photos of my bench. <laughs> Check yeah. it. That's been really helpful. So in turn, I've, you know, I've been lucky to have some really great coaches and um so happy for that great gym uh home barbell club uh you know i really had a, developed an extra level of appreciation for them when i was traveling for two weeks in chicago and i just like couldn't find a gym yeah it was tough and then i was i came home and i was like wow it is so nice to just have a gym that i count on um that i can you know again just training is something that really grounds me and I'm lucky to have an awesome gym. So shout out to Jesse and Matt for opening up home barbell club a year ago. Um, really just reduces a lot of friction in my life and it's a really optimal training environment for me. Um, and my fam, my parent, I have a lot of family showing up to this meet and yeah. again, fair weather, <laughs> fair weather fans but they didn't show up to south africa in the winter and they didn't show up to minsk belarus but they're still showing up <laughs> they're showing up um, for malta like everyone they're showing up for malta yeah. <laughs> so whatever it's fine um i'm grateful for um everyone who's showing up for me uh mm-hmm. and yeah and yeah i uh, i don't know there's just so many people i could shout out but yeah no that's you know, good. i think that's the I think that's the top level. Yeah, that's a good list. All right. Well, and shout out to you for having me on this podcast. Oh, I know it's course. been, we've been here a while. I no, know no, it's great. You wanted uh, it to be condensed, but no, no, my bad. I, I, for your sake, I wanted it to be condensed because <laughs> <laughs> I know you're super busy. You got stuff to do. Um, and Today you got happens trained. to be an off day. So, like, a that's awesome. Day off from work. So, yeah, that's so cool. So, all right. Well, Chelsea, I think we're going to wrap it there. Um, but thank you so much for coming on here taking the time to do this. 
we're all rooting for you. You know, it's going to be such an amazing story. I mean, it already is your comeback. Chelsea 2.0 is already like uh, just a very inspiring story for anyone out there that goes through adversity and, um, you know, has, has any kind of setbacks in life. It's just another example of someone who's like persevered and gone past it. And then now surpassed what you thought was even possible before, you know? So, um, super, super pumped for you. So yeah. And thanks to everyone who's listening to the power of team America podcast. And with that, we're out of here. Thanks, Paul. Thanks everyone. Thanks all the listeners.